Senator Byrd, who was involved in, in the drafting of this bill, uh, had words said at his funeral because his family at the funeral asked that in lieu of flowers, contributions be made to help the families of the UBB disaster. So following in Senator Byrd's huge footsteps, uh, H.R. 5663 is a truly comprehensive bill. It will make uh, life-saving improvements to benefit the hardworking men and women who often perform the most dangerous work in our nation. The Subcommittee on Workforce Protection has made uh, bringing worker health and safety into the 21st century our very top priority. So along with the full committee, we've held several hearings on health and safety, including two legislative hearings this year on H.R. 2063, the Protecting America's Worker Act, PAWA, which now has about 113 co-sponsors. And just about three weeks ago, uh, the subcommittee traveled to Middletown, Connecticut to explore the causes and solutions of a February explosion at the clean energy plant, which killed six workers and injured at least 50 others. This recent accident in Middletown, as well as the tragic blast at Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia and explosions in Washington State and in the Gulf involving multiple fatalities and injuries, underscores how our federal health and safety laws must be strengthened. This year has been a particularly tragic one for the American worker, and the sad truth is that these explosions probably, absolutely, could have been prevented had employers put miners and workers above profits. Among other important uh, provisions in uh, HR uh, 5663, uh, three, it strengthens whistleblower laws to protect those workers and to protect those miners who speak out about unsafe conditions. Since inspectors cannot be at every single workplace every minute, we depend on miners and other workers to be vigilant. Yet when they are, they often lose their jobs or are otherwise retaliated against. So Mr. Chairman, I commend you for inserting these protections in H.R. 5663, which also includes a provision to provide that minors cannot be fired except for good cause. H.R. 5663 also contains other important provisions, including a complete overhaul of the Pattern of Violations section in the Miner Act, the Mine Act, to effectively rein in serial violators. And H.R. 5663 adopts from PAWA updated criminal and civil penalties, family involvement provisions, and abatement during contests. Uh, some of this, which is, is already in the Minor Act, fortunately. So again, Mr. Chairman, thank you for your leadership. I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panel and, our, and, and these wonderful witnesses you brought before us today and to work with you to pass this very, very important legislation. I yield back. With that, the chair would recognize the ranking member of the subcommittee, Ms. Congresswoman McMorris Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this important hearing today. I don't think any of us will ever forget the April 5th explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine or the attempted recovery efforts that followed the weeks after. The explosion left our nation deeply saddened and with many questions about the cause and the overall safety of the Upper Big Branch Mine and mines around the country. Since then, several investigations have ensued, including within this committee, looking at the underlying causes of the explosion and the, needs for, the need for changes to our mine safety regulations and laws. I'm concerned that the bill we're considering today may be premature. We have yet to see the findings of any of these investigations, including by this committee. Let me be clear. We need to ensure that our minds are safe. No bad actor should go unpunished, especially when our lives, when lives are at stake. But we need to better understand what laws are working within the current safety structure and which ones are not, including examining whether Mine and Safety Health Administration was fully enforcing the current safety laws to the best of their ability. I fear that the bill that we are considering today may not even make our minds safer but it will negatively impact every employer in this nation. 
making numerous unrelated changes to osha in fact raising the cost of doing business for every employer in america at a time when jobs are scarce and the economy is struggling we need to do all we can to encourage policies that expand on economic recovery and that encourage a better working relationship between the safety inspectors and our employers not one that was going to take scarce resources away from safety and put it towards litigation. I'd like to thank our witnesses for being here and look forward to hearing more from them on what we can do to ensure that our workplaces are safe, including those that are underground, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, gentlewoman. Uh, gentlewoman yields back the balance of her time. Without objection, the committee is joined on the, on the dais today by two members of the West Virginia delegation who will be recognized to ask questions after the members who are currently in the room, the city members of the committee who are currently in the room, have an opportunity to ask questions, and that's Congresswoman, Congressman Nick Rahal and Congresswoman Shelley Moore Capito. Uh, welcome to the committee, and thank you for your involvement in this unfortunate event, but uh, we appreciate uh, uh, all of your help that you and your staffs have given this, uh, uh, this, this committee. And with that, I'd like to uh, introduce our first panel of witnesses at this hearing. Our first will be uh, Mr. Joseph Main, who is the Assistant Secretary of Labor and Mine Safety and Health, and Health Administration. He began working in coal mines in 1967 and has more than 40 years of experience in, in mine health and safety. He served as Administrator of the Occupational Health and Safety Department of the United Mine Workers for 22 years. Ms. Pat Patricia Smith is the Solicitor of Labor for the Department of Labor. Previously, Ms. Smith served as the New York State Commissioner of Labor since, 19, since March 6, 2007. Prior to that, Ms. Smith served as Chief of Labor Bureau of the New York State Attorney General's Office. Mr. David Michaels is the Assistant Secretary of Occupational S Safety and Health, and before coming to OSHA in 2009, he was Professor at George Washington University School of Public Health from 1998 to 2001. Mr. Michaels serves the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for Environment, Health, and, and Safety. Welcome to the committee. We look forward to your testimony. As you know, your written statements will be placed in the record in their entirety, and you proceed in the manner in which you're most comfortable. Most of you, you all have experience before the committee, but you know we have a lighting system here. The green light will go on when you begin, and a yellow light will give you a warning when to, to uh, wrap up, and then a red light uh, when that uh, should come to an end. But uh, we want you to convey uh, uh, your uh, uh, comments and, and important thoughts on this matter which you're most comfortable. Thank you. Mr. Main. Secretary Main, excuse me. Mr. Chairman, thank you, uh, Ranking Member, members of the committee. I appreciate the uh, invitation to testify on behalf of the U.S. Department of Labor, Mine Safety and Health Administration today <clears throat> about the uh, Mine Safety and Health Act of 2010. Secretary Solis and I are dedicated to safeguarding the health and safety of our nation's miners. And this bill helps reform, will help realize that goal. And I hope the <coughs> administration's, and uh, excuse me, I offer to the administration's uh, thank you, thanks to you, Mr. Chairman, Congresswoman Woolsey, Congressman Rahal, and your House and Senate colleagues, especially Senator Harkin, Senator Rockefeller, and the late Senator Byrd, for your work on a bill with critical provisions we have sought. We are all mindful of the urgency of our efforts. We have heard the pleas for change from the family members of miners lost in the Upper Big Branch Mine. I want Eddie Cook, Gary Corals, Alice Peters, Steve Morgan, Clay Mullins, Goose Stort, and the family and friends of all the fallen miners to know that their government is listening. We will make good on the President Obama's promise to act before another horrific mine accident. The administration fully endorses the committee's effort to pass this bill this session. Simply put, this bill will save lives. The bill is true to the Mine Act's principles that mine operators are responsible for the health and safety of our most precious resource, the miner. It promotes a culture of safety and will give MSHA effective new tools to hold to account mine operators who fail or refuse to meet their obligations. The most important of these new tools is the revamped pattern of violation system. As I have said repeatedly, the current system is broken. As I have <coughs> said on many occasions that we need to fix the pattern of violation system. No mine has been placed on a pattern since Congress enacted the law in 1977. This legislation, 
eliminates the rule that MSHA base a POV finding on final orders of the Federal Mine Safety and Review Commission, orders that are issued years after the fact. This bill requires MSHA to act on current conditions at the mine and takes a remedial approach, unlike the current punitive system for changing conduct at mines where noncompliance elevates the risk to miners. The bill also establishes strong, uh, stronger protections for miners to take an active role in their own health and safety. Unlike miners, MSHA is not a mine on every shift every day. As the committee learned at the Beckley field hearing, many miners won't speak up about safety problems for fear of losing their jobs. Armed with the bill's new training requirements and stiff penalties for discrimination, we are resolved to changing that culture of fear. The bill also fixes the serious problems of advance inspections, advanced notice of inspections. Inspectors cannot make effective inspections where unscrupulous operators break the law by getting advance notice of an inspection. They hide dangerous practices with temporary fixes until the inspectors leave. The bill increases criminal penalties, requires posting of the criminal provisions on mine property and gives MSHA subpoena power to un uncover this illegal conduct. MSHA will work with the Justice Department to stamp out this unconscionable practice. The bill's pre-shift examination provisions for underground coal mines advances the principle that operators take responsibility preventing, for preventing violations and not wait on MSHA to find the problems. Diligent pre-shift inspections and a communication plan to protect miners will lead to fewer citations and safer mines. The bill advances better technology for atmospheric monitoring of methane and other dangerous gases. That will help prevent deadly explosions and will provide critical information about mine conditions during mine rescue operations when timely information is a matter of life and death. Other important provisions include expedited power to revoke mine plans that do not adequately protect miners and improvements to our certification process for safety personnel providing regular recertification and a revocation process for those who shirk their responsibilities. Solicitor Smith will <coughs> discuss the bill's important clarification of what violations are significant and substantial and its improvements to the Secretary's investigation and injunctive powers. Finally, I would like to express the administration's support for the Protecting America Worker Act provisions included in this bill. All workers deserve a safe and healthful workplace. Again, I would like to thank the committee for moving this bill forward. I can think of no better way to honor the memory of Senator Byrd and the 29 miners who perished at the Upper Big Branch Mine than to enact safeguards to protect miners from another disaster. This bill is our best chance to accomplish this goal. I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Solicitor Smith. Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Klein, and the members of the committee. For more than three decades, the enforcement tools of the Mine Act and the Occupational Safety Act have played a pivotal role in cutting the number of work-related deaths, injuries, and illnesses. But as recent tragic events have demonstrated, all tools need to be periodically sharpened. The tools in the Mine Act and the OSH Act are no exception. I'd like to focus today on several provision, provisions in H.R. 5633 that will, if enacted, sharpen our enforcement tools and help make our mines and other workplaces healthier and safer places to work. Under the Mine Act, an operator with significant and substantial violations can be subject to increasingly severe enforcement actions, including withdrawal orders. Although Congress did not define significant and substantial in 1977 when it passed the Mine Act, MSHA and the Solicitor's Office believe the phrase applies to all violations that have a reasonable possibility of resulting in injury, illness, or death, and excludes only violations that either present no hazard or violations in which the hazard is speculative or remote. We believe this interpretation is consistent with the legislative history of the Mine Act. Unfortunately, the Federal Mine Health and Safety Review Commission does not agree and has established a four-part test for SNS, which in our view has hampered enforcement for many years. Violations under the commission-imposed standard must rise nearly to a level of imminent danger before they're considered SNS. I've given several examples of these cases in my written testimony. Section 201 of the bill would more closely reflect what we believe was Congress's original intent by defining an SNS violation as one in which there is a reasonable possibility that such violation could result in injury, illness, or death. 
We support this streamlined definition, which we think will provide a clearer standard for operators, enhance mine health and safety, and reduce counterproductive litigation over whether a particular violation is indeed S&S. Mine health, mine safety, and effective enforcement will also be enhanced by the bill's amendment to the Mine Act injunction relief provisions. Section 1082 of the Act authorizes the Secretary to ask a federal district court for appropriate relief, including a temporary or permanent injunction, if she believes that the operator of a mine has engaged in, quote, a pattern of violations of mandatory health or safety standards that constitutes a continuing hazard to the health and safety of miners. This provision has provided two difficulties. First, it requires the Secretary to, to establish a pattern, a term that closely echoes the term pattern in Section 104E's pattern of violations provision which, as Assistant Secretary Maine has described, has proved difficult to apply and to enforce. Second, it limits the basis for the pattern to violations of mandatory health and safety standards. Section 203 of the bill addresses these issues. It replaces the term pattern with the phrase course of conduct, and it specifies that the behavior that would support injunctive relief is not limited merely to violations of mandatory health and safety standards, but it include other things like violations of orders. A third welcome provision in the bill is the provision expanding the Secretary's authority to issue subpoenas for the purpose of taking testimony and other evidence. Currently, that, that power is only given in conjunction with public hearings. Section 102 of the bill would authorize the Secretary to issue subpoenas in conjunction with the performance of any of her functions. It would also authorize MSHA representatives and attorneys to question individuals privately, to take an individual's confidential statement outside the presence of the operators of the attorney if the individual so desires, and to maintain the confidentiality of that statement to the extent permitted by law. The bill also adds two new criminal provisions to the Mine Act and strengthens both the Mine Act's and OSH Act's current sanctions for criminal conduct. The bill would amend the Mine Act so that giving advance notice of, of MSHA inspections would be treated with the severity it deserves. Advance notice prevents MSHA inspectors from being able to observe the mining as it's actually occurring. The bill would make such conduct, which is currently treated as a misdemeanor, a felony. The bill would also provide a brand new criminal provision, making it a felony to retaliate against any person, minor or non-minor, who reports unsafe conditions to MSHA. Such conduct would be subject to the fine set forth in the code and would be carry a maximum prison term of 10 years. This provision would encourage minors, their relatives, and others to notify the government of mine safety violations by assuring them that retaliation for acting would be met with uh, effective punishment. Now, both the Mine Act and the OSH Act already contain some criminal provisions. However, most of these violations are treated as misdemeanors. Building on that foundation, the bill would analyze all such violations by individuals, operators, and employers under a knowing standard and would raise the maximum penalties for knowing violations fourfold and make first-time convictions felonies rather than misdemeanors, which is currently the case. These charges, especially the prospect of a significant period of incarceration, we believe would hold focus management personnel on their responsibility to keep their minds safe. The bill would also make other important improvements to the OSH Act. And I will mention just two of them. First, it grants rights to accident victims and their families and other representatives. They must be notified. Um, second, the bill would allow OSHA to require prompt abatement of all serious hazards, even if the employer files a notice of contents. And Assistant Secretary Michael's testimony will explain the importance of that. So I appreciate the opportunity to testify on this important legislation. As Secretary Solis said when the bill was introduced, there's a tremendous need for this legislation in order to save the lives and health of American workers in mines and throughout the nation. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Michaels. Thank you, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Klein, members of the committee. Every day in this country, 14 workers are killed on the job. Every day we encounter employers who cut corners on the safety and health of their workers, children who have lost parents, or parents who have lost children from workplace injuries. Workers are fired for voicing safety and health concerns, 
Companies subject workers to known hazards while the courts spend years deciding contested citations and our nation's workforce protection agencies are plagued with outdated laws, tools and penalties that make it difficult to deter safety and health violations. During the time that I've been Assistant Secretary for OSHA, 54 workers have been killed in explosions at the Clean Energy Power Plant in Connecticut, the Tesoro Refinery in Washington State, the Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia, and on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig. We add their names to the long list of recent disasters, like the explosions at the BP refinery in Texas, the Sago and Darby mines in West Virginia and Kentucky, and the Imperial Sugar Plant in Georgia, where dozens of workers were killed and hundreds more injured. But only disasters make national headlines. What is not widely publicized are the more than 5,000 other workers killed on the job in America each year. These tragedies happen in every corner of the country, usually one at a time far from the evening news and the morning headlines. Secretary of Labor Hilda Solis's vision for the Department of Labor is good jobs for everyone. Good jobs are safe jobs, and we want to do more to make our nation's workplaces safe. I therefore want to congratulate you, Mr. Chairman, and all the co-sponsors of the Minor Safety and Health Act for recognizing not only that the nation's 350,000 minors desperately need better protection, but that this nation's 135 million workers who are covered by OSHA also need better, up, more up-to-date protection. The Minor Safety and Health Act makes critical amendments to the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which has not been significantly updated in 40 years. This legislation would increase OSHA's civil and criminal penalties, enhance whistleblower protections and victims' rights, and give OSHA the authority to require abatement of serious hazards, even if and while the employer contests citations issued for them. These provisions are strongly supported by the Obama administration. Safe jobs exist only when employers have adequate incentives to comply with OSHA's requirements. When employers' voluntary efforts are not enough, swift, certain, and meaningful penalties provide an important incentive to do the right thing. However, OSHA's current penalties are not large enough to provide adequate incentives, especially for large employers. As a result, Unscrupulous employers often consider OSHA penalties the cost of doing business. It is more, effective, more cost effective to pay the minimal OSHA penalty than to correct the underlying health and safety problem. The Minor Safety and Health Act makes much needed in increases in OSHA civil and criminal penalties. Nothing focuses attention like the possibility of going to prison. This bill would make it a felony with up to 10 years in prison when an employer knowingly violates an OSHA standard which causes or contributes to the death of any employee. Good jobs are also jobs where workers' voices are an essential part of the conversation about creating safe workplaces. Since OSHA cannot be at every workplace all the time, we rely heavily on workers to act as our eyes and ears in identifying hazards. If employees fear that they will lose their jobs or otherwise be retaliated against for participating in safety and health activities, they are not likely to do so. The OSHA Act states that a worker may not be retaliated against for reporting injuries, illnesses, or unsafe conditions. Unfortunately, there are serious deficiencies in this law. The Minor Safety and Health Act better protects workers who refuse to perform tasks they reasonably, reasonably believe could result in serious injury or illness to themselves or to other employees. The Minor Safety and Health Act would also expand the rights of workers and victims' families and establish a family liaison in each OSHA area office to keep victims informed of the status of investigations and enforcement actions and to assist victims in asserting their rights. This will help our investigations since victims and their families are often the source of useful information. One of the most significant changes that this legislation makes to the OSHA Act is the provision that requires abatement of serious, willful, and repeat hazards during the contest period. Currently, if an employer contests an OSHA citation, that employer is not obligated to correct the hazard during the administrative contest period, leaving workers exposed to serious or deadly hazards for months or even years. The Minor Safety and Health Act would enable OSHA to issue failure to abate notices to a workplace with a citation under contest. It is important to note that this legislation also safeguards the rights of employers by allowing an accelerated appeal to the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Mr. Chairman, in the months that I have been at OSHA, I've spoken with children, spouses, and parents of workers who have been killed on the job. The, only thi the one thing they ask for, they ask, 
is for our laws to have the best possible protections to prevent more workers from leaving their loved ones behind. We applaud the important work this committee has done in drafting the Minor Safety and Health Act, and we look forward to working with you on it. Thank you for inviting me to testify. I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you again to all of you for your, uh, uh, for your testimony. Um, when I first came to Congress, we had the, uh, we had the uh, Scotia uh, coal mine disaster back in March of 1976. Joe, you and I have been at this about as long as anybody around here. Uh, and I was taken back this weekend looking at the uh, report on the Scotia mine. The report said that from 1970 to 76, the Scotia mine had been ordered closed 110 separate times, 39 times for imminent danger conditions. During this same period, some 855 notices for federal health and safety violations were issued against the company. In the period of January 1974 to February 1976, the mine had been cited for 63 separate violations of federal ventilation and methane standards. It was that explosion that killed, uh, what was it, 26, 26 miners and mine, mine inspectors, I think, uh, were included in that, uh, in that tra tragedy with the loss of, uh, loss of life. And it goes, uh, the report goes on and obviously one of the responses was uh, the, the idea of uh, changing the OSHA laws, uh, or the MSHA laws, and, and, and going to a pattern of violation. And now, 33 years later, uh, we see essentially the same problem of violations after violations, citations after citations, uh, dangerous and hazardous working conditions repeatedly uh, created through the operation of, of mines, and, uh, and now culminating with, uh, with the loss of, of 29 uh, uh, miners. Uh, I think that makes a rather compelling case. We'll make it for different reasons from different sides of the aisle, I think, but the fact of the matter is the current law isn't working. And, and the pattern of violations uh, uh, that existed then uh, uh, were exceeded even by, uh, uh, by the Massey mine here and the closures. How many, it was closed uh, 54 times. This mine was closed. At what point do this, does the benefit of the doubt go to the miner? And uh, I think when we, when we look at these, uh, uh, at the changes that we're seeking to make, it's about, it's about not only empowering the miner, but also giving, giving the miner, uh, if you will, the edge on a safe workplace. Right now, the edge is against the miner. The edge clearly works against the miner because the process is so cumbersome or so threatening to the miner that the miner never gets a level playing field to discuss what might be wrong. As we heard when we were in Beckley, you can lose your job, you can lose your shift work, you can lose your overtime, you can lose all sorts of, 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 of uh, events within the, uh, uh, within, within the mine. And so we go from, from 1976 to today and we're in the same predicament that we were in 1976. Now clearly, as we documented last year, there's been a gaming of the existing system. I don't know if it, was, if it, if it had been allowed to operate on the level, whether it would have been better, but it hasn't. And now the same people who've been gaming it are suggesting that we shouldn't make any changes so they can continue to game it, and, but they'll do, they'll, they'll, they'll do something better in lieu of it. Joe, I'd just like your comments. You, you've watched this expand of, 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 of disasters and, and violations and closures. Uh, I mean, this is, this is, this is not, a, uh, not a record to be proud of as a, as a, as a country. Uh, I began representing minors when I was about 19 years old and spent a lifetime in uh, uh, doing that to uh, improve my safety in this country. And I've looked uh, pretty hard at where we're at today and where we've came over the years. And, you know, there's a number of things that I think is just so compelling that we have to fix here. Uh, I think that the, the, the folks who was in Congress when he passed the 1977 law would be more than highly disappointed to find out that 33 years later, not one mine had ever been placed on uh, the uh, enforcement 
action to pattern violations that they sought. Uh, the recent uh, problems we've identified with the pattern of violation, I think, pales compared to the bigger problem here in the computer glitch that occurred and the, uh, uh, the policy of how mines are, uh, are selected for the pattern in terms of uh, a policy by district. Uh, I think those are just small parts of a larger problem. Uh, and I'm starting off with the fact that I think the pattern of violations is one thing that we have to fix in this legislation, and we have to do it in a way that uh, a federal agency will actually implement it, unlike the, the uh, federal agencies over the past 33 years. As a starting point, I think that's, that's something we have to fix. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Michaels, uh, you, in your testimony, uh, endorse the provision that requires employers to correct hazards which would cause serious bodily injury or death while employers are contesting the claims from the OSHA Review Commission. I, I just Would you provide some examples and, and why, this is, why this is necessary? Yes. The, the way the OSHA law works currently is that if an employer decides to contest the violation, they don't have to abate the problem until the contest is over. Now, most, it's worth noting that most contests are um, about the penalty. O employers don't like the penalty. They'd like to contest it. The second most about the classification, is it willful or not? But the third most important um, is they don't want to, to abate the hazard or they don't agree with the abatement. So in, in the period that, um, in between the end of the contest period, essentially the adjudication, nothing is done. So we had a situation, for example, in 2007, where OSHA cited in a, a company in Ohio, Republic Engineered Products, for not providing fall hazards ranging from 7 feet to 31 feet. Um, and there was a contest. The employer contested this. Less than a year later, in February 2008, while this contest was still going on, a supervisor broke his pelvis when he fell from 13 feet um, and, uh, from an unguarded location. OSHA felt, you know, when we went in and issued new citations about not protecting people from fall hazards, but the first, contest, the first violations hadn't been abated yet. And that's the sort of problem we're trying to deal with here. When we see a problem, we think it should be fixed immediately. Now, this, this bill provides, as I said, um, protection for employers. They can ask for an immediate hearing, an accelerated hearing in front of the Review Commission if they really don't believe the problem exists, and we can get it adjudicated quickly. But we can't let workers wait for months or even years unprotected until that contest is over. Thank you. Mr. Klein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, thanks to the witnesses for being here and for their testimony. Uh, Secretary Maine, I wanted to thank you for your prompt response uh, to my letter. I sent you a letter with some questions dated July 1st. Uh, you responded with a letter dated July 9th. I, it's not always we, that we get that sort of responsiveness uh, from members of this administration or any other. So thank you very much. In your, in your response, uh, picking up on the issue of the uh, pattern of violation, you expressed the frustration in the letter that I think I just heard here. You, you said plans, I'm quoting, plans for a new POV process have been underway for many months prior to the IG's alert memorandum. I had identified the POV program as requiring evaluation and modification shortly after taking office and so forth. And it seems to me that on both sides of the aisle here, there is agreement that the pattern of violation issue needs to be, needs to be addressed. Uh, so again, I just want to thank you for getting back. Uh, we will be staying in touch with you as we, as we go forward. Uh, the, uh, Solicitor Smith and, in fact, all of you uh, talked about felonies. In fact, uh, this law now has a lot of felonies. Um, in virtually every section, there's a, there's a new felony. And perhaps uh, increased penalties uh, uh, should be part of this. But I am a little bit concerned uh, that we may be uh, overreaching in a couple of places and, and get some unintended consequences. Uh, Secretary Maine, uh, one of the new felonies is associated with the advance notice of a mine inspection, as, as I read it. And certainly, I think we, uh, the chairman's language and our discussions would recognize that we don't want somebody to send out the alert and, and have people uh, cover up before the inspectors get there. O on the other hand, it seems to me the way the language is now that you might have uh, somebody just arranging 
for a union representative to and to a company inspector arranging for transportation or something of that nature i wouldn't think we'd want that to be a felony do you see any problem with that language or just hang them high well i think the intent here is to hold accountable those who give advance notice of an inspection that would have its purpose to be to provide some ability for the enforcement action exactly so let me interrupt because i run out of time so we want to be careful in language if we're going to make a law here and put it in statute that we that we be careful that we're going after the person who is doing this for the purpose of impeding the investigation and not for some other purpose we don't want to make everybody a felon i want to i think it's in our interest to make sure that we have a provision in place that changes the culture that exists today of advance notice being provided uh, to a mine that uh, undercuts the ability of uh, the law to be enforced and miners to be protected. Right, okay. Um, moving to another subject before I run out of time, uh, it was mentioned that uh, for the first time we're gonna provide a statutory definition of significant and substantial, and I think Solicitor Smith in fact mentioned that, eliminate the current four-prong test and so forth. Uh, my, my question is, have we, and I guess this will probably be in your domain again, Secretary Maine, have you looked at uh, what sort of percentage of violations would be S&S under this? I mean, currently now, according to the number I have here in front of me, there's about 36 percent of the citations are designated uh, significant and substantial. And I've heard some, uh, you know, sort of back of the envelope uh, calculations here that say, we might go to upwards of 90 percent. Have you looked at that? Do you have any idea? And and if if this number jumps to that sort of percentage, um, wouldn't that cause you to lose focus on on uh, with your resources and conditions that are supposed to be focused at these uh, really uh, egregious violations that threaten minor safety and health? Have you looked at that yet? Either um, Solicitor Smith, do you have the answer to that? Um, we, we have looked at it and thought about it. I can't give you any statistics because we have, we're not able to do an advance. But one of the things that we have been thinking about quite seriously is, um, is an increase in the contest rate. And we think that there are many provisions in this bill that will actually decrease the contest rate. I think this definition is a simpler definition. One of the reasons we have a high contest rate now is because we do have a four-part definition, which is complicated and difficult to prove. Um, the second thing that, that um, we believe is that, though we do believe that, that probably the number of SNSs will go up, that we believe that is actually consistent with the legislative history of the Mine Act, that they wanted different types of, um, of violations to be SNS. And I, I can give you an, one example, if you'd like, of a, of a type of a case where we think it should be SNS and it's not SNS right now. Um, and that is a situation in a coal mine where there are high concentrations of coal dust, where the, the ventilation controls, the, the curtains are not being um, put in place. There are, it's a gassy mine with a high concentration of coal dust, and we believe that that should be an SNS situation. The commission uh, ALJ found that because there wasn't any potential ignition um, at that moment when the, when the inspector was there and cited it, that there it was not SNS. Yet five minutes after that inspector left, or an hour after that inspector left, or a month after that inspector left, there could have easily been an ignition site. So that's why we believe that that type of a violation should be SNS. Okay, thank you. I see my time has run out. I just want think that we ought to be careful when we're putting things in statute that we don't have an unintended consequence of making everything but paperwork a an SNS violation, and therefore, if everything is bad, then sort of nothing is bad. Uh, I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. Mr. Kildee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Michaels, is it true that OSHA can only inspect the average workplace about once every 137 years? <laughs> there are different ways to calculate it, but OSHA has a relatively small number of inspectors. We, with our state partners, a little over 2,000 inspectors per you know, seven or eight million workplaces. So yes, it's a very, it takes a long time. If we tried to go to every workplace, it would take us a very long time. 
That's, that's incredible, but I, I, I read it and I checked with every one of the staff people up there and they said it's, it's the number. Um, gi given the, the lack of inspectors uh, relative to the number of workplaces, <laughs> what elements in this legislation will most help leverage your limited resources? I think there are, that's a very good question. There are a couple of them. The first, obviously, is whistleblower protection. Workers are the eyes and ears of OSHA. They have more on the line in terms of safety than any of us. They're the ones whose, whose arms, whose lungs are endangered. And so they have to feel free to, to, to raise issues of safety. And if they don't have adequate whistleblower protection, and frankly, <coughs> under the current OSHA law, they don't, then they can't raise problems with their employers without being fear of being of losing their job, and they can't call OSHA without fear of losing their job. So that alone will be, have a great impact. I think increased penalties will also have an important impact because the reason we have penalties more than anything else is deterrence. We obviously want to get the, the word out to employers that if you don't fix your problems before OSHA gets there, you'll have to pay a penalty. And the larger, right now, our, I don't believe that the, the fines that we can impose are adequately are large in terms of a deterrence effect. And so both of those will help us tremendously. In many instances, uh, OSHA uh, hands over or uh, contracts with state government to uh, carry on the inspection. How does that affect your ability to uh, do your job? Well, we work in cooperation with states. 21 states have programs where they essentially do the OSHA uh, they are the OSHA program for those states, and four additional ones uh, do that only for public sector workers. We work closely with them. The law says that they have to be at least as effective as federal OSHA, and it's our job to oversee them. And um, there are some problems that I know this committee has looked into um, with our ability to ensure that they do a job, their job well, and uh, we appreciate the help that you've given us on this so far. Um, but in those states, they are, the, they are OSHA, so we've got to help them and support them and push them into doing as good a job as they can do. But would it be, doesn't that create a greater burden on you? You have to trust a bit uh, further away from where these laws are passed that they be enforced. The OSHA law essentially says if states want to take on the responsibility, they should do that, and we, we will support them in doing that, and that's what we do. You know, I, I can recall just, I'll be very Quick, uh, I can recall a few years ago uh, near my district, Owasso, Michigan, uh, a young woman reached into the press and uh, to reach into the press, you're supposed to you know, hit two buttons and then you put your hands in and remove. And uh, she had done that and her both, both of her hands were totally oh. mashed. And uh, I, I can recall uh, that probably changed my 13-year-old daughter at that time, her attitude toward many things in life, how that could be permitted. That machine had been sighted several times, and they never really did anything to repair it. So I've, I've lost a little trust at that time in my OSHA. And I think that we have to really watch and make sure that this is a federal law, and if we do give some of the responsibilities to the state, to really watch them very carefully. Yes, we agree. In fact, this, here, this committee held hearings on this very question following what was pretty clearly poor performance of OSHA in Nevada. A number of workers were killed, construction workers. Uh, Nevada didn't, the Nevada OSHA program did not follow up well. Um, there were hearings held here. We started an investigation of the Nevada OSHA, which, which found some very serious problems, which we issued a report about. We're opening up a lot. We have opened up an office in Las Vegas to monitor their work much more carefully. But out of that also came a new program where we are um, doing essentially in-depth audits of every state OSHA program, including Michigan's. And we've just gotten the reports back. We're now reviewing them and we'll be releasing them soon. And hopefully that will be effective in, in helping to make sure that those state programs are effective as, as the federal program. Thank you very much, Dr. Michaels. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for holding this meeting. We appreciate it. And very serious issues that we need to address. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I want to look at uh, the OSHA in Section 705 and 706. The bill makes significant changes 
to the penalty provisions of the OSHA Act, uh, 706 would impose felony criminal sanctions as we've discussed on any company officer or director for knowing violations. And do you believe that this would, um, would lead to businesses to decide to litigate instead of settle because if they settle a future action on knowing could be used and therefore give a backlog of cases to establish the knowing part? Yeah. I'm going, to, I'm going to defer to my, the Solicitor of Labor on this um, one. When it comes to the criminal penalties, those cases are not litigated in front of OSHA. So what will happen in those situations is that if OSHA and the Solicitor's Office find that they're very significant cases, very significant violations, they will refer them to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the U.S. Attorney's Office will then examine them and make a determination about whether or not there should be a criminal prosecution um, in those situations. Oh, that's serious, I understand, but also any just settlement for any, any other violation before it gets to the U.S. Attorney, the employer may not want to settle and choose to litigate because settling would prove a knowing and therefore could be used against them later if this, somebody decides to take it to a, to a criminal court. No, that whatever, that not, that whatever, okay whatever finding is made in the civil court is not binding in the, in the criminal court. So the, 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 the knowing standard that the U.S. Attorney will make will be different than the knowing standard that will happen at, at the OSH Act, at the OSH level. You know, companies that have, have really good safety programs and safety records, the ones that they're, are really serious about safety, have safety audit teams. They go in and internal audits within their own workers and their own workforce. And, and do you think just the knowing, because maybe make a list of things we need to improve on and fix and do better uh, in terms of their overall program to make it robust and safer. Most major corporations have these kind of teams to do that. Does that affect this at all? Would, would it be... I Less think likely to have these kind of teams because of the I, establishment. Of I think you need to put that in perspective. Um, both the criminal penalties and the knowing pe and the knowing standard actually come out of the environmental safety standards: the Clean Air Act, the uh, Clean Water Act, the Resource Recovery Act. They have those exact same provisions, and yet I haven't seen any press reports that major companies, you know, have cut back on their environmental programs because of those provisions. What we're really trying to do with these provisions is make violations under these safety laws, uh, we'll call them the human safety laws, just as serious as violations under the environmental safety laws. And so, again, I, I think we have to look at, 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 the, at those laws that we've taken them out of, and I, I, ha I, I personally haven't seen any reports that there are fewer environmental corporate plans because of these provisions. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we're just trying to clarify, so thank you for that. And then in Section 703 would allow OSHA inspectors to immediately enact changes to the workplace without OSHA showing an imminent threat or providing employers with hearing or judicial review of the inspector's allegation. I understand we discussed the, the uh, trying to show a pattern, and, and, but it does allow them without showing an imminent threat. It, it puts the judgment on the OSHA inspector who could be unfamiliar with the workplace and have authority to disrupt business operations okay. before the objection to the validity of this citation could be heard. I understand that people, you're, you're concerned about the one who continues to object in order to present that from going forward. How, what about the, the good players in this? We're focused on the bad players. What about the good players going to get caught in this? You know, it's interesting. Oregon has this already, and we never hear any complaints. And uh, MSHA has this as well. Uh, most employers actually abate immediately. And as I said before, most contests are around the level of the fine and secondarily around the classification. Many companies don't want to be given a willful citation because that affects their ability to get, for example, municipal contracts. The third thing is a abatement. And so we're not talking about a large number of cases, but we're talking about important ones where people really are endangered. And so I'm not worried about the companies that have good programs because if, you know, they're the ones who are going to want to abate immediately. This is really aimed at those recalcitrant employers, those, those employers who don't want to do the right thing and where people could get hurt. Well, I absolutely agree with you on that. The question is how, how do you... How do you capture those without putting the net over people trying to do the right thing? I and mean, that, that's, that's where the concern. I understand that. And, and I agree with you completely on the, the, the recalitrant employer should be, as obviously we've seen in, in the mind before. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm about out of time, so I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Congressman Woolsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Solicitor Smith, you won't be here, uh, I don't believe. At least you won't be able to respond to panel two. So I'm going to ask you to respond to some of the written testimony that we will be hearing on the next panel. Uh, Mr. Snare, in his, his written testimony, uh, when he's talking about, cl he claims that the abatement during contest provision in Title uh, 
7 of the Minor Safety and Health Act will, and I quote him, he eliminate OSHA and the solicitor's office prosecutorial discretion in handling these contested cases and eliminate one source of potential leverage that can uh, they can use to resolve cases in the re with the requirement to impose immediate abatement. Uh, you're the solicitor's office. How would you respond to that? Well, I mean, that may be true in the current system. What happens is that if you you haven't abated, you could say, okay, now you'll abate now, we'll do whatever. But frankly, I think that worker health and safety and having immediate abatement is far more important than the ability of the solicitor's office to wheel and deal cases. He also argues that changes in Title VII will strain the resources of the solicitor's office. Uh, how do you see that working? How will you de uh, handle the, the increased demands of your well, office? I, I have to say, as a solicitor, I'm very concerned about the resources of my office. Um, and what we, there are a number of provisions in this bill that I think will, will counteract um, some of those concerns. First of all, there is the provision that says for, for pre prejudgment interest. One of the reasons that employers contest is because they contest the level of the penalties and they're hoping that they'll get penalties reduced. But if they, because there's time value to money. Um, but by, inc by requiring prejudgment interest, I think you're going to eliminate a certain number of those cases. Um, to the extent that you have individuals who don't want to abate, we're going to eliminate if this, pa pa this bill has passed a certain number of those cases. Um, the interesting thing is, unlike MSHA, where when they increased the penalties and there was, a, as we know, a great increase in, in, and there's a great backlog, the last time they increased the penalties in OSHA, there was only a 4% increase in the contest rate. And my office has already got together a work group to sort of deal with the fact that there may be an increase in the contest rate and how we're going to deal with it prospectively, um, as opposed to what unfortunately happened in the MSHA situation was that we didn't plan ahead for those possibilities and then we sort of got caught up with the big backlog. So we're not, I'm not really concerned about the resource level um, if this bill passes in my office. Thank you very much. Uh, Secretary Michaels, um, you probably would like to respond to both of those questions, but I'd like to ask you uh, about the, the workers' uh, ability for, to blow the whistle. <laughs> Why is that important? I mean, how does that make things safer uh, and improve the health of our work? Well, workers? well, let me give you an example. The, um, there have been press reports that workers on the Deepwater Horizon um, said, you know, they saw what was going on there. They said it wasn't safe, but they said they were scared for their jobs. They didn't want to say anything. Just think what would have happened if one of those workers had, you know, called a government agency and said, look, there are some decisions being made here. They're simply wrong. Can we stop it now? You know, that workers are, are the eyes and ears of every public health and environmental regulatory agency on the ground where the hazards are worst. And they have to, their voices are necessary to protect themselves and to protect the rest of us. OSHA has the weakest anti-retaliatory you know, whistleblower protection law of any agency. You know, OSHA actually enforces the whistleblower protection laws for all the new legislation, the, the uh, patient protection bill that's just been passed by Congress, the financial reform bill that's going to be passed soon will be given to OSHA to protect workers. All of those laws have much stronger provisions than the OSHA Act because we were the first one and it was written very badly you know, 40 years ago. It was written in a weak way. And so we and, and MSHA need stronger whistleblower protection laws because workers have to be able to protect themselves. They have to call us in. They have to be able to tell their employer, here's a hazard without fear of being fired. So Secretary Main, let's, let's follow up on this whistleblower. Uh, I, at our hearing in, in Beckley, it was very clear to me that uh, the workers knew they, they were working in very unsafe conditions. So did their families. Um, how are we going to be able to, besides, we have to pass this, but how are, what do we need to do then? What are our next steps so that they know they can count on the, this protection? I think the most important thing we can do is pass the legislation that puts in place uh, protections and vehicles to make these improvements. Uh, I was at the hearing in Beckley, West Virginia as well, and uh, anyone that walked away from there that didn't understand the real need to uh, enhance protections for minors to give them a voice uh, probably 
was on another planet, mm -hmm. uh, as, as the saying goes, that uh, there is a compelling case here uh, to be made. And I just want to touch that for a second in terms of, uh, of, of the need. When you have uh, minors that go to work that leave notes for their families uh, that they may not come back home from work, I think that's a very dire situation we have in workplaces in this country. And we, we really need to examine how we fix uh, a problem like that to make sure that, that the work, the, the message that the worker leaves, that uh, I'll see you when I get home tonight. Um, in terms of the, uh, the legislation, there's a number of pieces that's going to be very helpful to, to uh, answer the questions you've raised. One is uh, making it clear that minors have the right to refuse unsafe work. I think that's a critical provision that's going to be in the law. Uh, giving minors the right to let their boss know, let MSHA know uh, that there's an unsafe problem and put the obligation on the employer uh, which it is their employer's responsibility in the first place to make sure that the workplace is safe for those minors, but puts an obligation on the, uh, the employer to fix it, uh, sets protections for minors that if they are retaliated against for exercising that right with telling the government, telling their employer, that they have protections that are far more meaningful than today. Mm -hmm. I think the message we heard is that minors do not have faith that the protections that's contained in the current law really protect them. Giving minors a uh, fair shot of having a paycheck if uh, they do complain about a condition and MSHA comes in, does observe it, does take the enforcement action, does issue an order, uh, instead of waiting months or years to get a paycheck in, in those cases, uh, having a provision that requires minors to every year be trained on their rights, which is contained in the, uh, uh, this new legislation. I think all those pieces will help make the world a better place for minors. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlewoman yields back, uh, Congressman Morris Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here. We are all committed to making sure that we're taking steps to have a safe workplace, and especially as it relates to mine safety and the example of the upper big branch mine. Uh, I believe that it is important before we just move ahead with legislation that we, we better understand if anything in this bill would have actually prevented the mine disaster and what, the, what those complaints were and why NIMSHA hadn't taken action. But what concerns me, you know, we, I think we could get to an agreement on mine safety um, and the appropriate response. But also attached to this bill is a very broad uh, reform of OSHA that is only going to increase litigation, discourage settlements, and create disincentives for cooperation between business owners and OSHA. And we hear from the proponents that we need swift, meaningful, serious penalties. And we certainly get those in this bill. Um, the many new felony offenses, the increased penalties, first offense from six months to 10 years is increased from six months to 10 years. Um, second offense is increased from one year to 20 years. And I, I really believe that a more cooperative approach, um, better communication between OSHA and employers will we'll go a long way towards making our workplace safer. And I believe that we've seen that in recent years. So I, I want to ask the question, what evidence is there to suggest that this more adversarial approach is actually going to create a safer workplace? And how is litigation going to help make the workplace safer? And how are these changes going to impact small businesses and their ability to succeed, especially during a very difficult economic en environment? Well, I'm not sure I can answer all of that, but let me start out by trying. Um, when it comes to the, to the OSHA provisions, I think one of the things that, that this bill does is it puts the OSHA provisions basically on par with the MSHA provisions and in, in the provisions that it deals with so that now, so that workers in, in, in oil refineries can have this, the same safety standards as workers in mines have. And I think that's one of the reasons, for instance, we have the immediate abatement provision. The immediate abatement provision has already has been in MSHA. It's in, been in the Mine Act for many years. We don't, you know, hear a lot of complaints about immediate abatement, and we think that workers in oil refineries and other workplaces should have that sort of same safety rights. When it when it comes to um, the increase in, in in penalties, I think Dr. Michaels talked about OSHA penalties haven't been increased in in 40 years, and for 
a serious violation that a worker dies in, not a willful, but a serious violation, the maximum penalty is $7,000. And to the extent that you believe that penalties are a deterrent, and I believe that, that employers do pay attention, that most employers want to do the right thing, but sometimes, I mean, they need a little nudging, and um, a $7,000 penalty is not a big nudge. So I, I, I think that, um, that what we, we, we have seen is that most employers want to do the right things, but it's very difficult to get to the recalcitrant employers, and that's what these, th this, this bill is basically dealing with. And if I could follow up briefly, you know, we, we have various provisions in our laws and our policies to protect small business people. We, we reduce our penalties automatically for small business people, so in fact that $7,000 penalty becomes quite a bit lower for a small business. But it's also important to think about fairness. Beyond even the question of deterrence, there are so many small businesses that do the right thing, that, that make the capital investment, even during rough times, to make sure their workers are safe. We're putting them at a competitive disadvantage if we're saying to the other employers, the recalcitrant employers, don't worry, we're not going to do anything until someone's hurt, and then we'll just give you a small fine. That's really not fair. We have to level the playing field, and this, this bill is a small attempt to do that. One, one thing about our current system is that it protects due process by allowing the employers to challenge the assessments made by OSHA bef before requiring the corrective action. And it's not uncommon for those cited violations to be overturned or found not valid. If this legislation were to become law, what would happen if an employer is required to take a corrective action that's found to be warrantless? Would they have the ability to recoup any losses that have been incurred for errors in the determinations made by the OSHA inspectors? You know, I don't know the, the figure of the, um, the final, the percentage of violations that are actually overturned. It's, quite, it's a very small one. But we have a, this system builds in essentially an immediate accelerated review process. So if the employer has good reason to think that the abatement requirements that OSHA is um, putting forward are not accurate or fair, um, they can go to the review commission immediately and, um, and essentially stay that. Uh, I think it's quite fair, and I think that, that does provide the, the protection that small employers need. And if I could add to that, even though an employer has to abate the, the unsafe condition immediately, that doesn't mean that they can't appeal the penalty and that they can't get the penalty reduced. Just because you abate doesn't mean that you, you, you sort of have to give up and you, and you can't contest anything that OSHA's done. In the MSHA um, context, where you, where you do have to abate immediately, uh, you, you find that, um, that um, employers can test the penalties all the time. They can also contest the underlying citation, which would, it would mean if they win that, that they shouldn't have had abated. And that, the, the, in, in MSHA, it's less than a 2% uh, rate where the actual citation is overturned. So um, I don't think that, it, that, that that is really a big problem. Okay, time's, time's up. Mr. Thank Courtney. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as uh, uh, Congresswoman Woolsey mentioned in her opening comments, a couple weeks ago this committee held a hearing in Middletown, Connecticut, which looked at the natural gas power plant explosion, the clean energy plant explosion, where, again, we had testimony from a brother of one of the decedents who uh, described the misgivings mm -hmm. that his brother had uh, the day that they did a natural gas blow through the pipes, which uh, manufacturers of these turbine engines are now actually on record recommending not be used. Um, they recommend much safer alternatives. Yet it was pretty clear that the, that the workers did not feel empowered uh, to step out and, and say, uh, you know, why don't we evacuate the, the area when, when this procedure is going on? Again, there was a lot of unrelated extraneous workers who were in the area, and some of them were killed as a result of that blast. And uh, it, it is clear, uh, because obviously this isn't an MSHA context, it's an OSHA context, that the, the law contains many gaps in terms of uh, protecting workers who clearly were experienced in the work that they were doing, uh, be, but being given the uh, legal standing to actually step out and challenge whether or not it was a safe workplace for them to be. And, and obviously events proved um, that these misgivings were unfortunately um, well-founded. Um, so um, again, I think this committee should uh, respond to what we're hearing at these field hearings as well as today's testimony about the fact that we need to, to, str to um, strengthen these laws, not to hinder the economy, but to, to just get us to a point where the mission of OSHA is actually achieved. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask um, 
the um, solicitor about uh, two provisions that you mentioned in your testimony. Number one is the modification of the subpoena powers, where, again, what it, it, your testimony indicated is that what we're trying to do for MSHA is really put it on par with the subpoena powers in OSHA. And I was wondering if you could actually just kind of maybe be more um, specific in terms of how that would actually help uh, enforcement uh, of, of the, the mine safety. Um, first of all, let me tell you that giving the secretary subpoena power is uh, is very common. Not only do, does she have it in OSHA, she has it under the Fair, the Fair Labor Standards Act, she has it under the Fa Family Medical Leave Act. And what that means is that in, in an investigation, um, uh, we'll take, take the investigation right now. In the investigation, there are people that you want to talk to who don't necessarily want to talk to you voluntarily. There, there are papers that you need, there are records that you need. And that without subpoena power, the only way in, that you can do it now in an investigation is in a public hearing. If you're not doing an accident investigation, if what's happening is you're looking into a particular citation or in the litigation context, you are trying to prove that, it, that, that a citation was actually substantial um, and significant, they're, they're very often where you can't rely upon the kindness of strangers to get your evidence. You basically need subpoena power. Um, and so that's what we're asking for. Again, it's very common to give the secretary the subpoena power. She has it under OSHA. She has it under the Fair Labor Standards Act. And there's nothing improper with giving the secretary subpoena power. If there's a dispute, if somehow the, the employer feels that the secretary has subpoenaed something that they're not entitled to, either they do nothing and the secretary is forced to go into court and get, get an order, or they go into court and get an order to quash. So there's, there's plenty of, of places where any disputes can be resolved. And the notion that uh, this provision is somehow jumping the gun in terms of, um, you know, not waiting till uh, there's been a, you know, full finding, set of findings regarding this, this mine disaster. I mean, in fact, what we're talking about is really just uh, creating parity in the, in the law. Creating parity, exactly. And, and just following existing precedent that, that again, as you point out, um, extends to a, a wide areas of administrative law. I mean, the other uh, m area that you mentioned in your testimony was on injunctive relief in terms of trying to get the um, standards uh, clarified. Again, I was wondering if you could help us sort of understand what the problem is right now and how that change will, will help. Uh, again, the goals here. Well, right now, the injunctive relief provision, which has nev never been used, um, requires that there be uh, a pattern of violations. And it, Assistant Secretary Maine discussed the broken pattern of violations provision. And right now, what we want to do is to clarify it, to make sure that we're not required to get someone on an administrative pattern of violations before we can get an injunction. That's why we're asking Congress to change the language to course of conduct, which makes clear that we don't have to have an administrative pattern of violation, something which has never happened in 30 years. The second thing is that right now it limits the injunction power to mandatory health and safety standards. But think of a situation where an operator is, has a, a course of conduct of refusing to abate. That is, could be an order, or, or they um, have a course of conduct of refusing to withdraw minors when they're ordered to be withdrawn from the mines. That, that type of thing would not fit under the injunction provision right now. So we're asking that also to be clarified, such that not just pattern, not just um, mandatory health and safety, but, but other um, things would, would, would be subject to injunctions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly, we all believe that any workplace uh, death is a tragedy and any injury is unwanted by, uh, uh, by all of us. Secretary Michaels, you have talked a number of times about, quote, unscrupulous employers, unquote. You want to name any? Uh, we, we've certainly had our problems with a um, oil company which, with two initials, BP. Um, Anybody in else? We, you know, we've gone in there and we've said. Anybody else? Uh, no, I don't think we need to go into the specifics here of any one, but if you like, I could certainly get you a list. I'd, I'd love to have that list. Okay. Secretary Maine, after the um, tragedy at the uh, Upper Big Branch, MSHA took action to shut down a number of mines. Uh, did you have that authority to shut down the mines before the tragedy? The, uh, the tools that we used are tools that was used actually at Upper Big Branch in terms of uh, 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 issuing of orders under Section 10D of the Mine Act, uh, in particular, 
Uh, and those, uh, those shutdowns actually involved a short period of time in targeted areas of the mine where the conditions we felt merited that action. The problem is none of those set, shut down a mine to hold the mine down uh, in terms of what we're talking about with this legislation. That's what we're hoping to be able to do with uh, uh, Section 108, as, as the Solicitor of Labor has pointed out. But you could, could you have shut those mines down before the tragedy? Uh, we did at Upper Big Branch. I mean, uh, there was, uh, uh, at times, I know there was a three-day shutdown at Upper Big Branch. There was one that was a day and a half at Upper Big Branch. So when you see an imminent threat, you're able to shut Well, shut here, here's the problem, uh, and here's a problem we run into. You know, Section 104D of the Act was probably the most... Uh, effective tool in bringing uh, to bear uh, the uh, enforcement provisions of the Mine Act on the mine operator. But when you see an imminent danger, you're able to shut a mine down, correct? Uh, if you see an imminent danger over an issue until that issue is corrected. Okay. But what, 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 the, what we don't have I, I got is you. the... I got you. Okay. S uh, Solicitor Smith, you, you gave um, an example to the ranking member Klein about this uh, um, awful problem that, that was an imminent danger. If, if that was indeed the case, and you all recognize that, MSHA recognize that, then you could shut the mine down right then, couldn't you? No, that would not be considered an imminent danger. And the reason for that is? Because, because there was no ignition spark. What we're saying is that even though it's not an imminent danger, we think it should be a sub significant and substantial violation. An imminent danger is is a is a more substan more substantial more serious violation than a substantial and serious violation under the Mine Act. I want to talk a little bit about the knowing um, requirement that, that that knowing that something is happening exposes one to significant liability. I don't know if you saw the Politico this morning, the I article on danger in the hill. Safety hazards abound across the Capitol complex. There's a quote here, workplace safety experts say that if Congress were a private sector business, it would be at risk for massive fines from govern government regulators. Solicitor Smith, I'm, I'm just interested in, in asking you, who in the House of Representatives would you deem to be an officer with liability for knowing the 6,300 now you're violations? Asking me a, now you're asking me a corporate question. I'm not exactly, I'm not uh, well attuned enough to the corporate uh, uh, laws of of a corporation, I couldn't answer that, let alone I, could I answer it about Congress. I mean, I, but I'm sure that there is an appropriate expert out there who would know the answer to who is a corporate somebody officer ran, for Somebody purposes. ran the House, maybe? Somebody who ran the House? Well, maybe one of the lawyers who works for there the House. There you go. Let, uh, let me get back to MSHA. MSHA has inspectors in underground mines virtually every day, correct? Uh, Depending on the mines, we have mines that are very gassy mines that calls for uh, more frequent. And they're down there all the time, right? Not every mine, now. There's 14,500 right. mines. Right, but, but, but they're down in the mines all the time. It, if, if they know that something is, is a challenge and, and they don't do anything about it, are they exposed to the knowing level of, of liability? MSHA itself? They, they would not be, they would probably be exposed to um, other federal laws, but not that one. Well, why not? Because if they're they, not. If they, they're, they're the same as anybody else down there, right? Well, they could be, but they're not, in this, they're not an operator or an agent. So they don't have the, the criminal penalties that, that uh, one is exposing the officers and directors of the company to, is that right? Not under this statute. I'm not saying that they don't have under uh, other statutes. Do they have under, do they have criminal penalties under other, other statutes? I don't know the answer to that, but I don't know the answer yes, and I don't know the answer no. Okay, thank you. I go back. Um, I understand that it can take an inspector an hour from the time that they arrive to reach the critical areas in the mines for inspection. Uh, testimony from one of the mine workers, Jeff Harris, said that once workers knew there was an inspector around, they would start prepping the area so that it was up to code. And in the um, non-union Massey mines, uh, when an inspector came, the code words would go out, we've got a man on the property, uh, and those words would be radioed from the guard gates and relate to all working operations in the mine. Um, and uh, it would, would spread pretty quickly. I, I know, how does the mine safety bill deal with this. I, I know that there are severe penalties if there is advance notice, but is there 
a way of detecting such advance notice while it's happening rather than after the fact? You know, one of the uh, views of this legislation is that it, uh, for those who are bad actors in the mining industry, it makes them a uh, better corporate citizen when it comes to mine health and safety. And I think that was uh, intended the 69 Mine Act, the 77 Act, and I think it's the hope of this act that when uh, individuals who would contemplate making those kind of decisions realize the consequences, they'll be less apt to, uh, to do that. Uh, and giving advance notice to uh, interfere with the uh, inspection of the mine that, uh, that places miners in danger is one of those things that uh, we would fully expect the, the Mine Act to uh, send that kind of a message to. Mine operators who comply with the law every day, that take care of business, uh, you, know, uh, it, it, you know, this law is uh, aimed at getting at the worst of the worst out there that's, uh, that's failing to comply with the law. But we had hoped that uh, the uh, provisions that are contained in this act will uh, change the thinking of those who would desire to uh, engage in, in actions like that. And would there be a way of detecting this advance the, notice as it's happening? Yeah, I, I think the, uh, uh, the tools that are in, the, there's a lot of these pieces that actually fit together to help support the overall application of this law. And one of them is giving miners the opportunity to report uh, unsafe conditions, violations of the law. Uh, one is the subpoena uh, powers that uh, uh, are uh, contained in the law as well that gives an opportunity for that information to be gained uh, from those folks that would be engaging in that. Uh, and, you know, just uh, a multitude of other provisions that will help hopefully change the, uh, the attitude toward folks that would, would engage in those practices. Then let me ask about another issue, which is uh, once an inspector was known to be in, in the area, uh, certain actions would uh, try to cover up the situation. For instance, uh, this same Jeff Harris, a West uh, Virginia miner, testified that um, they would put up ventilation curtains, and then once the inspector left, they would take them down, and that some workers would point this out but the inspectors would reply, we need to catch it. Um, it is good to have whistleblower protections, but would it be worth it to report such things, for miners to report such things, if, if, if it's necessary to catch it in order for some action to take place? You know, this is a practice that was not only reported from the Upper Big Branch mine, but uh, around the same time the Upper Big Branch disaster, we made uh, in special inspections at mines in response to complaints uh, about conditions uh, at, at these particular mines. And in three of these mines, we actually went to the mine, captured the phone to prevent a call from being made underground to uh, uh, try to determine what the conditions were uh, in real time. And uh, the agency uh, inspectors were able to do that. And he found uh, cases, as you had described here, that was described at the Upper Big Branch Mine where ventilation controls were not in place where mine officials were actually on site overseeing the work activities without uh, these kind of ventilation controls, uh, apparently miners working in dust, and uh, the lack of controls to dilute methane uh, from exploding. We are hopeful that uh, the combination of changes that we put or that are put in this legislation uh, will help, cur help curb those, giving a miner a voice to report them, uh, having a fear that something could happen if an operator decides that they're going to try to engage in these kind of activities, uh, such as the, you know, the subpoena authority would have to root out that kind of information, uh, having uh, greater penalties in terms of criminal application of law for those who uh, engage in knowing conduct like that. So I think collectively there's a number of pieces in this legislation that help uh, to uh, deter that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of conduct. And if the worker points this out as the inspector is there, is that worker protected under the whistleblower provisions of this law? Uh, from everything I've read, I, I think absolutely yes. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Holt. Um, I'd be happy to yield to uh, my time to Mr. Rahal. Well, uh, under the agreement we had, you were in the room at the time. Uh, oh. You can ask, and then, okay. uh, right. then I'm going to Mr. Okay. Ray Hall and, and Ms. Capito fine, at, fine. That, at okay. that point. Thank, so thank you can thank use you your time now, or you can give it to Mr. Ray Hall. Yeah. No, thank you. You can do um, something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, what I would like to uh, uh, address then is the uh, safety technology and 
whether we are, I mean, enforcement is one thing, and it, it, this is, uh, I mean, I think the points that have been, that have been raised, um, perhaps partly while I was out of the room, uh, are important, but I'd like to find out whether we are putting enough emphasis on the development of the safety technologies. Um, communication, for example, uh, it's something that uh, uh, we've been working on in, in New Jersey, not a mining state, but good in telecommunications. And uh, we've been working on uh, non-interruptible uh, communications uh, that can work in cases of, of uh, coal mine collapse and uh, dirty environment and so forth. Um, and I'm wondering if we need to be building into the legislation uh, more support for this sort of thing. I don't think there's any question that we could always use more support on technology development in the mining industry as uh, I think identified whenever the uh, uh, Miner Act was enacted in, the, in 2006 and looking at ways that can prod that I think is, uh, is very beneficial for miners in this country. One of the provisions that is in the bill uh, deals with uh, uh, beefing up the atmospheric monitoring of the uh, conditions in the mines that would uh, enable uh, information to come very swiftly uh, to the, uh, the operational folks at the mine on increases of methane that could cause an explosion, on increases of carbon uh, monoxide, it's an indication that there may be a fire burning in a mine, on changes of airflow that uh, indicate that ventilation controls are damaged somewhere to uh, be able to uh, get miners more quickly out of the mine. And I think by the same token, looking at beefing up this, uh, the technologies that's, that's available for use during mine emergencies. One of the things that I've, I've been doing mine emergencies for uh, 20 some years, and one of the things that, uh, that uh, uh, inhibit our ability to, uh, to fastly enter a mine is a lack of knowledge about the mine environment. The decision to send in mine rescue teams into an environment that could be explosive and cost them their lives. And one of the provisions in the, uh, in the legislation calls for uh, more research to develop uh, technologies that could be in use uh, during the uh, uh, post-accident uh, circumstances where you could more quickly understand that mine environment, more quickly get into the mine to, uh, to uh, uh, rescue miners. So yes, I think things like that we need to be looking at more proactively. Thank you. Would the other witnesses care to comment on that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ray Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate you and Ranking Member Klein for allowing me to uh, sit with the committee this afternoon and certainly uh, am happy that you chose to name the pending legislation after our late senior Senator Robert Byrd. Um, Joe, let me preface my questions by saying I understand, and I'm sure we all do, the situation that you inherited upon taking over as uh, Assistant Secretary and Head of MSHA. There was uh, quite uh, a strain on budgets, as there still are. Uh, perhaps training was not uh, up to par and safety uh, was not stressed uh, to the degree that it is today. Uh, and uh, there was a different ideological uh, bent from above, which is very important, as we all know, whether it's MSHA or OSHA or uh, uh, MMS in the case of the oil rig disaster. And so you uh, have been making quite a few changes, and we, we all appreciate that and different emphasis, et cetera. Uh, you've also uh, commented uh, on Chairman Miller's bill and the manner in which uh, you feel it will help correct a lot of the current uh, deficiencies. The critics of the pending legislation will say that it unduly penalizes uh, the good actors or that current law is sufficient, why not enforce current law? Uh, that's, that's what the critics will say of the pending legislation. Uh, I, I believe you've answered that in, in a number of different uh, responses uh, already, but uh, one of the previous questioners on the minority side asked you if you currently had the power to shut down a mine, and reference was made specifically to UBB. 
Uh, we all know there's been various lawsuits filed by the owners of that mine against you. Uh, we know what the strategy is. It's, uh, if it were not a serious issue, it would really be laughable, but it is a serious issue. Uh, and uh, the question was asked uh, uh, if you had the power to shut down the UBB specifically. We know that one of the lawsuits is challenging you, challenging you on ventilation plans. We know there's been controversy over uh, the adoption of the ventilation plan just days before this tragedy struck. Uh, my question is, uh, if the owner knew there were problems with the ventilation plan and had serious disagreements with MSHA over the ventilation plan that you adopted or that you approved, could the owner of the mine himself shut the mine down if he felt it was unsafe due to that ventilation plan? I think that uh, it is without question if the operators of Upper Big Branch thought in their mind that the mine was dangerous, they could shut that mine down uh, any time they desired. They don't need your approval to shut down their mine. They don't need they our approval to shut down the mine. And Thank you. <coughs> uh, let me ask you uh, about... Uh, well, I believe you've, you've commented on the whistleblower protection. I'll, I'll skip all that. Uh, as you know, there's been a lot of questions by the current families of UBB miners as to who has access to the mine post-disaster, post-April 5th. Uh, they want to know names. They want to know uh, the full list of who has been in that mine during the investigative process. Uh, and, and I commend you in the manner in which you've responded to the families and you and uh, uh, Kevin Strickland have had these meetings along with our state uh, workmen's or our state office of uh, mine inspection and uh, David McAteer. Uh, but my, my question, I guess I'll get right to the bottom line. Uh, why can't we make a disaster scene a crime scene like we do if there's an accident on the highway or something? We rope it off. Nobody's allowed to come onto those premises except the law enforcement personnel except those who are investigating the disaster. Uh, that question has been asked a number of times by the families. C could you comment on that? I, I know uh, perhaps legal ramifications to it, as well as knowledge of the mine, but uh, j just comment on why we just cannot rope it off like a normal crime scene. I think we're transitioning closer to that, uh, Congressman, as we move forward, and I think the outgrowth of uh, uh, you look back at this investigation may push us closer to that kind of a, uh, a model than we have. There's been a historical model where uh, upon, the, uh, upon an accident, an investigation is conducted that usually involves uh, at least three to four parties, depending on uh, uh, the uh, representation of mine, the uh, federal agency, MSHA, state agency, the mine operator, and if there's a uh, miner's representative, represent the miner. So you always have that group that's going to be involved in those kind of traditional investigations. This is a, uh, at Upper Big Branch is uh, a, a bit hybrid from that, given the involvement uh, of uh, a uh, uh, Justice Department uh, investigation, whatever they're doing with regard to uh, their uh, dealings with the, uh, with the disaster. Uh, the other thing that I think that uh, we all realize is that uh, there's a lot to uh, maintaining a mine. Uh, as we went back in, we had to have uh, uh, a lot of work done to repair damages, to make examinations, uh, resources that the mine operator has that's, that's necessary uh, in the uh, actual investigation of a mine. It's a little difficult to, uh, to get around. I think the concept of the government taking over total control and not letting anybody in that mine uh, is a challenging one since the mine operator runs, uh, controls the power center, the power cables, uh, the ventilation of the mine, the whole, whole nine yards that takes to, to uh, keep a mine safely operating. And that's so MSHA would have to legally just take over the whole mine in uh, order to prevent company or any other non-pertinent uh, uh, players that, uh, coming yes. into that mine after the investigation, and, but I mean, I think after the tragedy. Yeah, I think you're right, but I think there's some real complications in trying to do that, given the uh, uh, maintenance, the uh, inspection, the resources it takes to keep a mine open, and that you have to be in the mine correcting and fixing things. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. The gentleman's time has expired. Congresswoman Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank you and the ranking member for having the hearing and also for allowing me to participate. 
Uh, as all of you know, West Virginia is still mourning the loss of our 29 miners killed at the Upper Big Ranch mine, and we're still uh, mourning the passing of our senior senator and wish to thank everybody here who are non-West Virginians. Uh, thank you for your uh, good thoughts and prayers during these difficult times for us. Um, I actually represent Sago, and during the Sago mine disaster, shortly after that, we did do a uh, Mine Safety Act, and I think we found in, in the process of this unfortunate accident that some of the, some of the, um, uh, uh, several of the measures that we moved forward in that bill actually uh, helped us, it didn't maybe, uh, it helped us in the, um, in the uh, inspections or in the rescue efforts uh, and the timeliness of those. So I was very pleased to see that, that some of those measures helped. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get a good outcome, but it did help. Uh, I would also like to say that, um, so uh, Secretary Maine, when you were here in February, you mentioned several things that changes that needed to be made, a lot of which are in the, in the chairman's bill. Uh, I just would like to go four points that you mentioned, improve implementation of the Mine Act and, and mine safety and health, simplify the contested case process, uh, improve consistency by MSHA inspectors and supervisors and create an environment where fewer cases enter the contest process. I'd like to ask about that because I th I'm concerned, and this has already been asked before, but I'm concerned that since um, recently we've had, since that minor act, we've had, um, gosh, 30 percent more numbers of citations by MSHA. We have uh, many more penalties, but it's also the pr the um, the contested case has taken 587 days when when before it took 374 days. I know you're familiar with these statistics. My concern is, I mean, that concerns me, and we've heard this about a lot of mines that it's prolonged, prolonged, prolonged. Is the process that this bill puts forward going to perpetuate that and make it worse? Or uh, and, and what provisions do you think are being made? Um, I I, under, I heard the solicitor say that she thinks that the standard will be clearer and it could actually pull down the number of cases, but I think most people looking at it thinks it's going to increase the number of cases. What's your reaction to that? I'm going to take the first part and I'll let Solicitor uh, okay. of Labor Smith take the second part. Uh, if you look at the pattern of violations, which a lot of folks think that uh, a reason that there is a contesting of the violations is to forestall the application of a, of a potential pattern of violations is one of the one of the uh, issues. The legislation really uh, changes that to the extent that uh, the we will not be looking at uh, the uh, final orders of the commission to make that determination. So that's one piece I think gets sort of removed. So you don't really have to quickly. wait till the end to make the determination. Is that correct? Pardon? My, you don't have to wait till the end to make the determination. That's correct. Okay. Uh, based on the orders citations that are issued. Um, I think the, uh, some of the provisions built in that stiffens the uh, resolution of these cases for the commission uh, also helps uh, uh, disincentivize those who would uh, be taking a shot at uh, having a, or to contest the violation to get a better deal, uh, which is one of the concerns I have. If you look at the, the comments that I made uh, back in February, and I think it's pretty close to it, that Basically, all it took was uh, uh, mailing a, a letter costing 44 cents to appeal a, uh, a uh, penalty that's been assessed to a violation and uh, wait a couple years and mm -hmm. get maybe a 47 percent break. There's a lot of provisions I think is, is uh, designed to undercut that or to uh, change that, to uh, disincentivize that and uh, solicit. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Smith may have some other additions to that. Basically what this bill did was look at the incentives for why the contest rate went up so much, mm -hmm. why the reasons the contest rate went up so much. It wasn't just because there were more um, inspectors and more citations, but the actual contest rate went up dramatically. Right. Um, and so as, as the Assistant Secretary said, one of the things was that individuals would contest so that there wouldn't be a final, a final order for a pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that's been eliminated. Secondly, to the extent that there was a great delay, there's the time value of money, so prejudgment interest uh, reduces that incentive to, to uh, contest. Then, as, this, this, as the Assistant Secretary said, um, you know, there, there was a GAO report in 2007 that said the Commission would, it would often dramatically reduce the penalties even when they upheld the citation. Right. So, there's, so that is, that's been eliminated in this bill. 
Um, so we, we think that, that the, the sort of non-necessary reasons to contest have been really dealt with and that that will help the contest rate in the future. Well, thank you. I see my time is up, but I would like to ask the chairman and the ranking member. I have worked on a, a solitary bill on my own that incorporates a lot of what you have, but then some other suggestion based off of what Secretary Maine suggested in, in March. So I would I hope we, maybe we could work through some of these <coughs> as you're marking up the bill. I appreciate that. Glad to take a look at it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Altmaier. Secretary Maine, I wanted to focus on the regions within MSHA. And I come from Western Pennsylvania. And anecdotally, I hear that from mining operators and miners alike throughout Western Pennsylvania, that there's a difference in enforcement, which results in a difference in outcomes, safety records, within the different regions of MSHA. Western Pennsylvania, comparatively, having a pretty good record, anecdotally, that's what I hear. And I wondered, is there truth to that statement that there is a substantial difference in the safety records within regions? In your experience, which regions of the country have the best records of safety, which ones need improvement, and is this due to a difference in enforcement within the regional administrators of MSHA? I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania, and uh, I probably know a lot of the folks that you've uh, uh, conferred with in the, that, uh, that area. Uh, I, I think, you know, as a starting point, there are some mines, uh, mine operators that take a different view about how they run mines than other mine operators do. And I think uh, as we all have looked at statistics and, and saw the, a number of mine operators that seem to uh, chug along every day and uh, comply with the law and, and have a good safety management program in place, it's, it's unaffected by uh, the law. And then others seem to have difficulty uh, complying with the law. Uh, and to me, uh, a lot of that's the, the management style. I'd have to take a look at the, the, the different geographics to, uh, of, the, of the country to answer your question. Uh, it is my hope that the, the mine operators in that region are some of the best in the, in the country and, you know, and uh, uh, do operate their mines uh, uh, as safe as uh, they have the capability of doing. Uh, it's not just the mine operators because many mine operators, of course, operate mines within multiple jurisdictions, multiple regions, but it seems as though there are certain regions, even though mine operators operate in more than one region, there are certain regions that have better safety records than others. What, what's the reason for that? Well, the, uh, when we announced our plans to uh, do the follow-up uh, public hearings on the Upper Big Branch disaster, one of the things that we are going to be uh, doing is holding a public forum to address one of the issues I think that you've raised, and that is uh, the concerns that we've heard from, uh, from the miners, from mining families about the culture of safety in that region, uh, and to uh, try to do uh, something that, uh, that changes that culture to a more positive one. I think that you know, there is a, an expression from miners and mining families in the uh, area of the upper Big Branch Mine that has raised serious concerns about uh, the way that uh, mine safety in those mines are managed and the, and the fear that miners have and families have that you may not have, that you may not hear uh, as much or uh, any from some other regions of the country. That's something that we are taking a look at with regard to the, the upper Big Branch Mine. And have you found, Secretary Maine, that there's a correlation, either direct or indirect, between the number of citations for safety violations that are given out to a mine operator and the number of incidences that occur? Uh, in cases, there is some correlation to that. I think as a starting point, there's two factors that uh, we would probably look at the most, and that is the number of orders that a mine uh, gets or receives that is a... Uh, a sign that things are uh, more out of control, uh, as the saying goes, than one that would not be receiving a lot of orders. A uh, second one would be the, uh, a mine that has a large number of SNS violations. And we're trying to provide some parity with that analysis in that a mine with 35 miners running uh, an underground coal mine, let's say, with 35 miners having one or two mining units compared to a mine employing 900 miners and 15 mining units. I mean, we have to be able to look at those comparisons to, to, to make those uh, judgments from, but all things considered, SNS violations, orders, and high accident rates would be amongst things that we would look at to make those determinations. Thank you. Secretary Michaels, uh, very quickly. Do you think it's appropriate, as we consider this bill moving forward this week, uh, to 
have a distinction between coal mines, underground coal mines, which present very different challenges to surface metal mines and non-metal mines? Uh, you know, I am not familiar with the mining industry because both surface mines and underground mines are covered by MSHA. So I would defer to my colleagues on the panel here. Secretary May. Uh, yes, yeah, since we have jurisdiction over all the mines in the country, and I think it's very wise that Congress uh, made that decision in 1977 to give all miners the uh, equal protection under the law. Uh, there is differences from uh, uh, some one coal mine to another. There's differences from a coal mine to preparation plant. There's differences from a, uh, a uh, sand and gravel uh, facility. There's differences from a cement facility. But all things considered, the way the law is constructed, there's different standards that apply to the, the coal side and the non-coal side to uh, provide the kind of protections that, you know, that we would like to have in place. And I think it's important to understand that uh, uh, miners that work at a, at a sand and gravel facility ha has a right to as much protection as a, as a miner does at a uh, underground coal mine. Uh, not to say that they face the same kind of consequences or conditions, but uh, all those uh, work sites on their own have various hazards that, uh, that need to be dealt with. And, you know, some hazards you're going to find at a sand and gravel facility or a cement facility is some of the same ones you're going to find at a, at a coal mine. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Tierney. No questions? Well, thank you very much for your time and your expertise and, and your testimony. And obviously, we'll, uh, as we digest everything we're hearing today, we'll be, uh, we'll be back to you. But thank you so much for all your cooperation and help in uh, drafting the legislation and bringing your experience to that. Thank you. Thank you. The committee will, uh, will hear from a, a second panel uh, at this point. We're going to swap out. Welcome to the, uh, to the committee, and thank you very much for uh, uh, agreeing to, uh, to join us uh, this, this afternoon. And to Mr. Stewart, Mr. Grayson, thank you. I know you traveled some distance to, uh, to get here, and we appreciate that, uh, that very much. Uh, let me go through the introductions of this uh, panel for the, uh, for the audience and members of the committee. Uh, Mr. Stanley Goose Stewart worked as a coal miner for 34 years and was an employee of the Upper Brand Big Branch Mine in West Virginia for 15 years. He was close friends with many of those killed in the explosion at the mine in April. Mr. Stewart was on his way into the mine when the explosion occurred. Dr. R. Larry Grayson is a professor of energy and mineral engineering at, at Pennsylvania State University. He was the first associate director of the Office of Mine Safety and Health Research at the National Institute of Occupational Health, uh, Safety and Health. He chaired the, the Mine Safety and Health Technology and Training Commission established by the mining industry in 2006. Mr. Bruce Waltzman is, is the Senior Vice President of the Regulatory Affairs of the National Mining Association. He monitors federal health and safety policy for the U.S. mining uh, industry. Mr. S Cecil Roberts, Jr. is the President of the United Mine Workers of America and has served in this capacity since 1995. He is a sixth generation coal miner and serves on the Safety and Occupational Health Committee of the AFL CIO. Mr. Jonathan Snare is a, is a partner in the Morgan Lewis's labor and employment practice. Mr. Snare's practice focuses on labor related issues, including occupational safety and health, mine safety and health, and whistleblower cases. During the Bush administration, he served as Deputy Solicitor for Labor and Acting Solicitor of Labor under Secretary Chow. Ms. Lynn Reinhardt is the general counsel to the AFL-CIO. She is a former aide to Senator Howard Metzenbaum of the Senate Labor Committee and a member of the Obama transition team for the National Labor Relations Board. From 2007 to 2009, she has served as co-chair of the ABA Committee on Occupational, Self, uh, uh, Occupational Safety and uh, Health. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to your testimony. 
Again, your written statements will be included in the record in their, uh, in their entirety, and, and you should proceed in a manner in which you are most comfortable. Also, if, if, uh, if you want to comment on something that you heard back and forth between the members of the committee and, and uh, uh, the witnesses, feel free to do so. That would obviously be helpful uh, to, the, uh, to the members, I think, as we sort through the record as we go forward uh, with, this, uh, with this legislation. But welcome, and again, thank you. Mr. Stewart, we are going to begin with you, and welcome back to the committee. We need your microphone on, Goose. We don't, don't want to miss one of these wor words. Of Thank you, Chairman Miller, for allowing me to speak here today. My name is Stanley Stewart. Most people know me as Goose. Been a coal miner for 34 years, last 15 with Performance Coal at the Upper Big Branch Mine in Mont Coal, West Virginia. And I am a Massey employee. I was underground April the 5th when UBB exploded. <clears throat> Luckily for me and my crew, we were able to escape. I'm here to speak for my 29 brothers who did not make it out. This tragedy should never have happened in America today. The April 15th explosion was a 1920s-style explosion, and we should be beyond that. The only reason 400 men didn't die is because of the mechanization used in coal mining today. Something needs to be done to stop outlaw coal companies who blatantly disregard the law. Many things were wrong at the UBB mine. Management regularly violated the law. Some examples. Concerning advance warning on inspector arrivals, a section boss would be called from outside and he'd be told it's cloudy outside or there's a man on the property, meaning there is an inspector outside. Get things right to pass the inspection. In 2009, we were made by Chris Blanchard, the president of Performance Co to cut coal going into our air supply. We mined this way for over 2,000 feet, and several months later, we were allowed to mine the legal way. On January 4, 1997, an illegal air change was made during our shift. An overcast was knocked out, short-circuiting our air, and it caused an explosion. It wasn't as big as April the 5th, but I thought I was a dead man, and I know it was covered up. Around 03 or 04, there was a bleeder that spewed methane in the mine. The methane readings were 5% at the power center and at least 20% further back in the mine. We were made to sit underground for nearly an hour before management let us leave the mine. When we'd moved the long wall to a new face, we were always made to load coal before all the shields and ventilation were in place so someone could call Mr. Blankenship and say, we were in the coal. In the months before the explosion, I worked on Headgate 22. My section foreman consistently got low air readings. He would complain to upper management. He would be berated, told to go back to work or he would lose his job, and the air was never fixed, so he quit. The long wall worried me because of the constant ventilation problems and with so much methane being liberated and no air moving, I knew that that area was a ticking time bomb. There were at least two fireballs on the drum of the shear on the long wall, according to separate reports of miners working those shifts. That meant methane was building in the area, proving ventilation problems and possible methane monitor problems. I've worked long wall in dust so thick I couldn't see my hand in front of my face and couldn't breathe because of improper ventilation. I once asked the assistant coordinator why we didn't have proper air on the long wall. I was told, it's funny, you're the only one to say anything about it. My response was, that's because everyone is too afraid to lose their jobs if they say anything. In my years of working for Massey, I feel they've taken coal mining back to the early 1900s using three principles fear, intimidation, and propaganda. I know personally that Massey sends a safety director to the hospital to pressure miners hurt on the job back to work and have them sit in the office so their accident doesn't get listed as a lost time accident. This bill needs to require truthful reporting because with a fabricated safety record, MSHA can't target the right minds for a pattern of violation. 
In my first few years at Massey, I saw more men maimed and killed than in my 20 years in the Union. This is why the UMWA was formed in 1890, to protect and give miners rights. A coal mine is the worst place in the world to work without rights, and at Massey you have very little rights. You knew if you stood up to them, you'd be out of a job. This bill must be passed to give all miners rights. If this bill's passed, hopefully miners will feel they can stand up to the Massey Empire or other road companies and protect themselves without retaliation. The current system of pattern of violations must be fixed, so the outlaw companies must be made to understand that they can't continue to put miners' lives at risk to turn a profit. It puts some teeth in the law. It makes retaliating against miners who report violations to MSHA or refuse to work in unsafe conditions subject to a fine and by making retaliation subject to criminal penalties. Outfits like Massey will always find a way to fire you regardless of the laws. That is why it is important to have rights to challenge any unfair firing in an underground coal mine. With a union, you have that right. Without a union, this bill gives miners protection to fight firings. This bill must pass to keep companies honest or to make them pay the price. Partisanship needs to be set aside on this legislation because human lives are at stake. 29 families are suffering from this needless explosion. Their communities are suffering from their deaths, and I myself am suffering. In closing, I simply ask you to remember what the Constitution says, of the people, by the people, and for the people. People's lives are at stake. It's very serious down in those mines, and those people need protection. All I ask is that you do the right thing and help them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Grayson. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee. As a former UMWA coal miner myself, mine superintendent and manager of Mine Safety and Health Research at NIOSH, I really thank you for the opportunity to discuss provisions in H.R. Uh, 5663. It is agonizing that we are again at a point where major underground coal disaster has shattered the lives of so many people, and that industry and MSHA just seem to be powerless from stopping these disasters. We had only one such event during the period 1991 through 2000. Thus, it appears it can be done. The Tripartite Mine Safety Technology and Training Commission, which I chaired in 2006, indicated the key to achieving this goal includes processes that, number one, require major hazard-related risk management, which must now involve the screening of mines with high risk for disasters and serious injuries. Second, facilitate the creation of a safety culture of prevention of hazardous conditions that can lead to major hazard events, and I'll add serious injuries as well. It is imperative that these process, processes must drive adoption of best practices and building a culture of prevention. The objective is to ensure that everyone in the organization involved with the mine, top to bottom, performs the critical task of their jobs aimed at removing threatening conditions with painstaking thoroughness. The same approach must be used in MSHA. The commission noted that industry has to fundamentally change the management approaches and the work practices taken to fulfill basic safety requirements. We recognize that simple regulatory compliance alone is not sufficient to mitigate significant risk. Now, since 2007, my graduate student and I worked on developing an effective and straightforward tool to analyze the risk of underground coal mines. The Safe Performance Index model contains essentially the same elements discussed in the new pattern of recurring non-compliance uh, non or accidents provisions for screening high-risk mines. The accident-related elements that we used included the no days loss incidence rate, the non-fatal days loss incidence rate, and an adjusted severity measure where statutory charge days are added in there. The citation-related elements we used included the number of citations per 100 inspection hours, the number of SMS citations per 100 inspection hours, and the number of unwarrantable failure and imminent danger withdrawal orders per 1,000 inspection hours. I'll give some detailed results on the SPI modeling of an 82 mine sample in my more extensive written comments. The most salient points related to HR 5663 are summarized as follows. Our sample represents about 18% of the producing mines 
and I'm convinced that the SPI works very well in objectively determining high-risk mines. Similar discriminatory power could be achieved with an appropriate application of the new pattern of, re of recurring noncompliance or accidents provisions of H.R. 5663. I believe the key to success depends on a judicious weighting of the components delineated in the subsection on rulemaking as specified in paragraph 8B to determine the threshold criteria. The worst performing 10 percent of mines in our study were characterized by different measures. Some had a high injury rate and a high elevated citation rate, while others had either a very high injury rate or a very high elevated citation rate. Four MSHA pattern potential uh, potential pattern of violation mines were on the list, and one was the long wall mine. Three of the worst performing eight mines got there because of a terrible severity measure. Two of them had good SNS and order rates. Thus, I reemphasize that the injury experience must be integrated with the citation experience in considering mines for pattern status. Regarding benchmark criteria for the 90 day evaluations, I'd suggest that the major hazard related SNS citations and orders should immediately have a higher benchmark of the 25th percentile of the top performing mines. A pattern mine should alternatively be permitted to pass the benchmark for citations if the SNS rate, SNS rate is reduced by 70 percent, provided that reduction of 70 percent takes the mine's SNS rate to one that is below the mean for the grouped mines. The target of having mines in the top 25th percentile set forth in the bill for reducing the injury rate appears appropriate. Regarding termination of pattern status, both the SNS rate and the order rate need to be uh, considered, and the 80% reduction of the rates needs to be coupled with the caveat that the improved SNS and order rate should both be less than the mean for grouped mines. For injuries, the performance benchmark of the 25th percentile of top performing mines is a reasonable challenge for trying to build a culture of prevention. The goal in this legislation should be to ensure that a low-performing mine that deserves to be placed on pattern status should be compelled to build a new safety culture that focuses day-to-day -day on preventing major hazard-related conditions and lost time injuries. I commend the committee for inclusion of several important provisions. First is the independent investigation of mining disasters. Second is ensuring that MSHA inspects mines during normal operations on all shifts. I do recommend that MSHA inspectors should also perform a major hazard sweep at a mine at the beginning of a quarterly inspection. Third is allowing MSHA to invoke justifiable mitigating circumstances for an identified pattern mine. In closing, I do believe that the new pattern of recurring noncompliance or accidents provisions will be a much needed improvement of the current pattern of violations process. The one year remediation process coupled with quarterly monitoring of performance should inculcate in pattern mines adoption of practices and processes aimed at building a, a safety culture of prevention, which is necessary to eliminate mine disasters and ultimately all fatalities and serious injuries. This concludes my oral comments. Be happy to take questions. Thank you, Mr. Waltzman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity to share our views on H.R. 5663. As backdrop to today's discussion, it's helpful to note that the U.S. That US mining operations have decreased fatal and non-fatal injuries by 72 percent and 64 percent respectively over the last two decades. Eighty-seven percent of all U.S. mines worked last year without a single lost time injury. Those trends have su sustained our dedication to injury-free mining and we expect 2010 will close with more than 85 percent of all U.S. mines operating without a single injury. The tragedy at the Upper Big Branch Mine in April, however, was an abrupt interruption to the positive trend and has appropriately caused all of us to re-examine the adequacy of the industry's current safety and health practices and the existing statutory and regulatory, regulatory authorities to achieve that goal. While there are many voluntary initiatives, technology advances, and innovations in minor training and safety awareness underway in, in U.S. mines today, Today's hearing focuses on legislation to address the role and uh, enforcement authorities of the Mine Safety and Health Administration and the relevant rules that govern their actions, the actions of mining operations and the workforce. In support of our shared safety and health goals, we have looked at the proposed legislation within the framework of the following principles. Will it improve minor safety and health, our number one priority? 
does it ensure greater transparency in the regulatory, investigative, and enforcement process? Will it build upon rather than dismantle the positive features of the existing law and regulations that have con contributed to improvements? Does it avoid additional layers of enforcement, penalties, and other actions that are already provided for under the law but not fully utilized? Does it provide penalties that are commensurate with the severity of the violation? Will it protect due process rights? And will it maintain a robust domestic mining industry that meets the needs of the American people while maximizing the safety and health of its workforce? We've used this framework to identify omissions in the proposal that merit attention, provisions that basically align with these principles and that the industry could support with some modification and provisions that are counter to these principles. And all of these are discussed in our written submittal. Consistent with our principles, NMA supports improvements in the nation's mine safety and health laws that target recalcitrant operators, create fair and uniform procedures for enforcement, provide transparency in the development and administration of regulatory requirements, focus resources on problem areas, and encourage the development and implementation of performance improving processes that are outside the bounds of the current regulatory structure. We believe that before embarking upon a comprehensive overhaul of the Mine Act, there should be a clear-eyed assessment of whether fundamental components of the existing law are being properly and fully executed. As Secretary Capito, as uh, Representative Capito, I apologize, touched on, there are many areas that have been identified by, by the Assistant Secretary that are in need of attention. However, we believe that H.R. 5663 fails to address these fundamentals, raising real-world world questions about its effectiveness. For example, when half the inspectors are new and the other half are not properly trained, as documented in the IG's recent report, won't adding more punitive and complex requirements aimed at mine operators only put more weight on an unstable foundation. If there's no strong correlation between SNS violation rates and injury rates, as documented in several analyses, what does this tell us about the effective implementation of the existing law? If injuries, incidents, or near misses are arising more from at-risk behavior than from at-risk conditions, are we properly focusing the program and effectively allocating safety resources? If inconsistency in the application of the law is, as the Assistant Secretary has suggested, an impediment to regulatory certainty and compliance, won't be, we be better served by improving implementation rather than imposing more changes on inspectors and operators who are currently struggling to attain clarity, consistency, and credibility in the application of the safety law and regulations? Finally, are our shared safety objectives well served by a, by a full-scale insinuation of MSHA into the complexities of mine management? We understand the call by members to address perceived shortcomings in MSHA's statutory and regulatory structure. Indeed, we share many of these concerns with certain elements of MSHA's authority. However, we do not believe that sufficient att attention has been given to the weaknesses in the execution of that existing authority. Absent such an evaluation, we believe the legislation layers harshly punitive and restrictive provisions over a flawed fr framework to the detriment of successful safety and health programs. Mr. Chairman, we remain ready to work with members of this committee on actions we should be taking, some of which I've outlined, just as we did before Congress enacted the Minor Act of 2006. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Mr. Roberts. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for this opportunity to appear again before this committee. Um, I appreciate the opportunity we've had to work together. Unfortunately, we've been working on a problem that is, is at this moment unsolved, and that's the fatalities we're seeing in the coal fields and the grief that has come to the families of coal miners throughout this country. Uh, Ranking uh, uh, Member Klein, we appreciate this opportunity, the members of the committee, my fellow West Virginians, Congressman Ray Hall and Congresswoman uh, Cavito, I applaud your uh, leadership that you have shown throughout the time of the Upper Big Branch tragedy, trying to comfort the families uh, who have lost loved ones. 
I want to thank this committee for naming this legislation after my dear friend, Senator Byrd. Uh, the last appearance he made in the United States Senate was on Upper Big Branch, and I had the opportunity, and I believe I was the last witness to ever testify before Senator Byrd had the opportunity to go up and thank him for what he had done for coal miners, and I said at the time of his death, he was the best friend a coal miner ever had. I want to mention one other person here today. I want to applaud the courage of, of a coal miner who's testifying here today, and that's Stanley Stewart. I hope everybody on this panel uh, and on this committee understands the courage it takes for someone like Stanley to come here and testify and tell you what is, has gone on in this coal mine and what a difficult position that places him But in. And I admire him uh, for what he has done, and I've told him that personally. I want to say that uh, these miners who lost their lives at Upper Big Branch, uh, they were employees of Massey Energy, but they were also my friends. Uh, I knew a number of these uh, miners, played ball with some of them. I knew their parents, and in some instances, I knew their grandparents. And I'd just like you to think for a moment. There was a young man, and it's been mentioned here, but not dwelled upon very much, named Josh Napper. You have to work six months in a coal mine to get a minor certificate in the state of West Virginia. He had not yet earned a minor certificate, but he knew he was working in a dangerous place. And if a 25-year-old uh, miner who had not yet obtained a minor certificate knew he was working in a dangerous place, didn't everybody else know that? Didn't the CEO of this company know that? Didn't the mine foreman know that? Didn't everyone know this? He wrote a letter uh, to his mother, and he had a one-year-old baby that I, I had the opportunity to meet at the uh, memorial service uh, in Beckley. And he said, tell, tell my fiance, tell my baby uh, that I love him and I love you, Mom. Those are the kind of letters we used to write when we was going to Vietnam. Uh, World War II, and World War I, Korea, and people going off to the Mideast to fight. And you, you understand a young man writing those kinds of letters. That's the kind of letters we're supposed to write going to work. This man knew, this young man knew that he was in a seriously dangerous place. And he lost his life there. He knew he might, and he left a letter behind. Mr. Chairman, I would just say to you that some think we're moving too fast here, but I've had to revise my testimony several times as I've appeared in the Senate and in the House because of the fatalities that continue to occur here. On Friday, we had the 41st fatality that happened in Illinois. That's just this past Friday. So as we ask ourselves, are we moving too fast? Maybe we should ask ourselves, are we moving too slowly here? Because miners are continuing to die in this nation's coal mines, and we've got to find out why. I want to point out something, if I might. 41 miners have died this year in the nation's coal mines. 31 of them in one place, one company. Now, we can say, gee, that's uh, just unfortunate that occurred. That's not unfortunate. There's something wrong here when 31 out of 41 fatalities occur at one company. It's not just 31 out of 41 this year. 54 fatalities at this one company in 10 years. And this same uh, company comes to Congress and testifies that they have the safest minds in the country. God help us that that's true. We know, and there's no one up on this, on this dais today, and no one sitting here today knows that this is, this is a normal occurrence. There is something drastically wrong at this company. And 41 miners have lost their lives this year and we have failed these miners in this country when that happens and we have to do something about that i'm going to tell you what works and i'm going to simplify this we have to have good laws we have to have those laws obeyed and we have to have those laws enforced by our government whether it's federal or state and we've got to punish those who fail to abide by the law I'm going to tell you why good laws work. There's a perfect example of that. We just recently celebrated the 40th anniversary of the Mine Act. In those 40 years prior to the passage of the 1969 Act, 32,000 coal miners died. How many? 32,000. 40 years after the passage of the Act, 3,200. So those who say laws don't work, the statistics say otherwise. Now, 
every time we have ever passed a law or considered a law, there are those who come here and say it's going to put us out of business. I invite you to go back and get the legislative history of the 1969 Act. When people came in here and said, if we have to comply with this law, there won't be a coal mine operate in the United States of America. I suggest to you that the coal industry has continued to operate. It has continued to prosper. Good laws obey those laws. And I'm going to make a bold statement here. Most of this industry, and I have said as high as 95%, do the right thing. So we're not writing laws here to destroy an industry. We're writing laws to try to make those who will not obey the law comply. That's what we're trying to do. And we have to give MSHA the tools that they need to enforce the laws, and we've got to punish those who absolutely refuse, Mr. Chairman, just refuse to comply with these laws. They turn their backs on they ignore them, and say these laws really don't pertain to me. And I don't care what Congress writes. I don't care what Congress says. I'm not complying. Now, you've got to come to grips with that. That's the truth. Now, I know I'm getting a little emotional here, but just do the research on it and see if I'm telling you the truth. You've got to stop the lawbreakers if you want to save minors' lives. And with that, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Snare. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, Chairman Miller, Ranking Member Klein, and members of the committee. I appreciate the op opportunity to appear before you at this hearing to address a number of important issues raised by the proposed H.R. 5663. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing on Title VII, the amendments to the Occupational Safety and Health Act. I am testifying today on behalf of the Coalition for Workplace Safety, which is comprised of associations and employers who believe in improving workplace safety through cooperation, assistance, transparency, clarity, and accountability. My testimony and comments are not intended to represent the views of my law firm, Morgan Lewis, or any of our clients. By way of background, uh, Chairman Miller, as you, know, as you indicated, my legal practice is focused on labor and employment matters, including workplace safety and health issues. I also served for a number of years in several positions at the Labor Department, including the Acting Assistant Secretary for OSHA and as the Deputy Solicitor from 2006 to 2009 and the Acting Solicitor. The Coalition's concern with this proposed legislation is the dramatic changes to the OSH Act that are focused mm -hmm. exclusively yeah. on punishing employers, which at the end of the day will not result in any actual real-world impact that improves workplace safety and health. The Coalition further believes that this approach has unintended consequences which may undermine the, the underlying intent and goals of this bill. Penalties alone will not improve workplace safety. Remember, in many cases, penalties are imposed after the fact of an injury or fatality. The critical mission of OSHA is to assist employers to make sure that injuries and fatalities never occur in the first place. As such, the current focus should be on efforts to prevent workplace injuries and fatalities before they occur, not creating new methods of punishment after the fact. The coalition is further convinced that this proposed legislation will create greater cost, litigation, and hamper job creation, especially during these challenging economic circumstances. The adverse impact on the ability of employers to create jobs is a critical factor and should be of concern to this committee and Congress. These proposed changes will impose substantial costs on businesses, particularly small businesses, which are struggling to create and maintain jobs. Let me briefly summarize our concerns with this legislation. The abatement of hazards in Section 703 creates a burdensome new requirement on employers to abate any hazard subject of a serious willful or repeat violation. The only way for an employer to suspend abatement while contesting the citation is to file a legal action with essentially a very high burden of proof um, similar to a temporary injunction. This is essentially a mini trial on the merits of the underlying citation. The other punitive provisions include the failure to abate and a pre-final order, pre order interest imposed on employers, again, before the adjudication of the citation on the emerits. Abatement is more than protecting against a hazard. It is part of accepting responsibility for the violation. Mandating abatement before allowing the employer to exhaust their due process adjudicative rights is similar to asking a criminal or civil defendant to pay a fine or serve a sentence before a trial is held. As to the civil penalties in Section 705, the increases in this legislation 
focus again on a punishment-focused approach, which in and of itself will not result in any improvement of workplace safety and health. From the employer's perspective, how can we not say that this bill is about punishment, broadening the scope of a repeat violations in this legislation and the other new proposed penalties will not result in our judgment in any prevention of workplace injuries or fatalities. Remember, there is no evidence that higher penalties, civil or criminal, have any bearing or result on improved workplace safety and health. As to the criminal penalties in Section 706, the expansion of these penalties, both by reducing the intent level to knowing and creating personal culpability will, create, will yield greater levels of challenges. First, as to reducing the level of intent from the current willful to knowing would upend decades of OSHA law uh, going back to, to, to 1970 and introduce tremendous uncertainty and further guaranteeing substantial increases in contested cases. As to the criminal liability on an officer or director is also equally troublesome. We believe it will impose a witch hunt to hold corporate officers and directors liable. Expanding the criminal liability for an officer or director uh, will make an employer, any employer's personnel unduly subject to prosecution and it will create a great deal of confusion. You saw that confusion in response to a question by Congressman Price to the solicitor as to what it means and who is a corporate officer or director. The coalition is also concerned about the whistleblower requirements in section, uh, 70, in section 701. I'll refer and incorporate my comments in the written statement. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, the, the proposals in Title VII of H.R. 5663 would result in significant and dramatic changes to the OSH Act with the imposition of a more punitive civil and criminal penalty structure, make it harder for employers to exercise due process rights. We believe this legislation is only about the punishment of employers, the vast majority of whom want to do the right thing with regard to workplace safety and health, and this bill will do nothing to prevent workplace safety injuries and fatalities. And as recent data make clear with the lowest level of recorded injuries and fatalities, the best way to achieve a continued improvement on workplace safety and health is a proactive approach with, ba with balance of enforcement and compliance assistance. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present these remarks, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Reinhardt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Klein and members of the committee, both for holding this hearing and for inviting me to testify here today. We really appreciate the committee's continued efforts to promote worker safety and health including the introduction of the Minor Safety and Health Act last week. Clearly, we still have major problems in the mines with getting mine operators to pay attention to worker safety, problems that need to be addressed. President Roberts and Mr. Stewart have eloquently spoken to these issues. We fully support the mine workers uh, on these points. But the problem isn't limited to mines, and that's the fundamental point that I, I want to speak to here today. Just as the Mine Act needs to be strengthened to get mine operators to pay attention to safety and put safety before profits, so does the main law protecting worker safety and health, the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970. The OSHA Act is a good law. It has saved lives, it has prevented injuries, but it has serious shortcomings and it is woefully out of date. Other than a civil penalty increase in 1990, the law has never been updated or strengthened in the 40 years since its passage. It has fallen behind the Mine Act, and it has fallen behind environmental laws designed to protect us from harm, from contaminated air, from contaminated water, from unsafe mines, but the OSHA Act has fallen far behind. Now, some would say the law is actually fine and that the problem that we face is just with a few bad actors out there. Uh, we disagree. This is a systemic problem that needs to be fixed. We still have more than 5,200 workers dying on the job each year, an average of 14 workers each and every day. Millions of workers are injured each year. OSHA has issued thousands of citations for violations of the OSHA Act in connection with those fatalities that I just referenced. This is not a matter of just happenstance, things happen. These are violations of the law that lead to worker fatalities and injuries, and it's a systemic problem that needs to be addressed. The average penalty for violating the OSHA law, a serious violation of the law, that carries a substantial risk of death or serious injury is $965. Even in cases where workers are killed, the average penalty is about $5,000. This is not enough to get employers to pay attention to safety and make investment in safety on the front end. It is too easy to write penalties like this off as just a cost of doing business. 
The criminal penalty provisions in the OSHA Act are even weaker. As you know, the maximum penalty under the law for willful violations of the law that result in a worker fatality is just six months in jail, which is a misdemeanor. And there's also, it carries a $250,000 fine. The penalties for polluting the environment or harassing protected wildlife on public lands are higher than the penalties for violating the OSHA law and killing workers. Because the penalties are so weak, the Department of Justice rarely prosecutes cases under the OSHA Act. One telling statistic, the Department of Justice brought more, four times more criminal cases last year for violations of the environmental laws than have been brought in the entire 40-year history of the OSHA Act. Four times more cases in one year than in 40 years under the OSHA Act because the criminal penalty provisions are just so weak. Now, we've heard today that the bill is too punitive and what we need is more compliance assistance and cooperation, that penalties have nothing to do with promoting safety. But when OSHA only has enough inspectors to inspect workplaces once every 137 years on average, which is the case now, you have to have strong penalties when violations are found if the system is to work. Otherwise, the law just does not provide an adequate incentive for employers to comply with the law and protect workers. The penalties, in our view, have everything to do with bringing about greater compliance and, and prevention of problems before tragedies occur, and they're just too weak right now to make that happen. We've heard today about the importance of strong whistleblower protections and about making sure that workers are protected when they speak out about job hazards. And the whistleblower protections in the OSHA Act are the weakest of any of the 17 whistleblower laws enforced by OSHA. They're out of the mainstream of whistleblower protections passed by Congress over the past number of years, signed into law by both Republican and Democratic presidents. Um, the, the details of these weaknesses are um, contained in my written statement, which is submitted for the record. Um, suffice it to say, the whistleblower protections in the OSHA Act are woefully out of date and really do not provide workers with recourse when they suffer discrimination for raising job hazards or exercising their rights under the law. They have 30 days to bring their case forward. They're dependent on the Secretary of Labor bringing their case. If the Secretary doesn't act, workers are out of luck. They have no private right of action, and this is completely out of the mainstream of whistleblower protection laws. So if we're serious about our commitment to worker safety and health, and this committee clearly is, and if we're serious about wanting to prevent deaths and injuries on the job, we need to strengthen the OSHA law and provide meaningful penalties that will bring about greater compliance before fatalities and injuries occur. We need to strengthen protections against retaliation for workers who raise job hazards. We need to get employers to correct hazards more quickly and not use the litigation process before the OSHA Review Commission to stall abatement and leave workers at risk. And that's what the Minor Safety and Health Act would do. If I may take just 20 seconds to make one more comment about the concerns that have been expressed here today about this bill costing employers money and that that not being a good idea at a time when the economy is really struggling. We're for jobs. We're all for jobs. We're all for safe jobs. When we think about the costs here, you need to think about the costs of workplace fatalities, injuries, and illnesses. They're enormously expensive. Not not just in human terms, which are, those costs are incalculable. You cannot bring a loved one back. But the financial costs of injuries and illnesses are $50 billion a year. And so we submit that preventing those injuries, preventing those fatalities, and uh, eliminating those costs is actually good for the bottom line and good for the economy. So we strongly support this legislation and the, uh, the OSHA Act provisions in it and urge its prompt adoption. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you for your, uh, for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Stewart, again, thank you. Uh, Mr. Roberts referred to your, your courage. Uh, I made the statement at the end of the hearing in, in Beckley that, uh, that uh, this, is, this is an official oversight hearing. This is a continuation of our investigation and that uh, people ought to understand that any, in, any actions of intimidation are an action against obstructing the official duties of this, of this congressional committee. But thank you very much for being here. You know, I was always mystified when I first started working in my hometown. I, I grew up in a refinery town, and there used to be a big clock out in front or a big uh, calendar, and there was always day, you know, d accident free days. When I got inside the refinery over a number of years working there in summer and, and after school and different times, uh, I was always amazed that you see people get just crushed. And, and they, you know, I'd go next day, I'd look at the clock to see if, if it was up there, you know, that somebody, had, we lost a day here. And no, no, and I said, well, what the hell happened to that guy? And they said, oh, he, you know, he's, 
to, he's here, he's on site. They, they had him show up, they got him to the county hospital and, and uh, he's back on site, but he's, you know, he's not on our team anymore because he, he can't, can't walk or whatever. So I always thought that was a little bit misleading, but I always look at it when I visit the different refineries and it's still, they're still doing it. Um, but, but thank you for, for, for being here. Uh, you know, it just amazes me, there's nothing corporations fear more than, than shareholders with power or workers with power. They just can't get over uh, the idea that maybe uh, they keep talking about their obligation to the shareholders and their care for their workers, and yet they just don't want them to have any, any power, not to, even to be able to stop an unsafe, uh, unsafe workplace. Uh, Mr. Grayson, let me, let me ask you a, a question here. As, as I look through your data and, and, and your safe performance index, when I look at the long wall mines, and I think there were 40 long wall mines, is this the universe of law, long wall mines, or are there more? Yes, sir, that's correct. It was 40 long wall mines that were active. There are two others in Trona and one that was not yet active. Okay, uh, so of the active ones in 2009, mm -hmm. a quarter of them essentially uh, uh, had no withdrawal orders at all during that calendar year. Yeah, that's approximately correct, yes, about, about a quarter. And then you get down to uh, uh, number 20, uh, 22, 23, before you get to, to six withdrawal orders. Uh, number two, number 22, 20. Line. I think it's 20, 23, uh, 23, is it? On the left, oh, it came. Uh, Shoal Creek. Shoal Creek, is it? You get down to Shoal Creek, which I All think right. had five, and the next one has, has six. Okay. And then you get down to the bottom of this 40, and you get 56 withdrawal orders mm -hmm. in one calendar year, and that's mm -hmm. the Massey mine. So one thing, it, it apparently is possible to operate a mine without a withdrawal order. Oh yeah. A quarter of them are doing that. Yeah. And we're doing with the substantially uh, Of all the number. 82 mines, 20 of 21 uh, did not have an order of the top 25%. The top 25% mines, 21 of them out of, out of 84 is what it was, but then there were two duplicate mines. But 20 out of 21 had no orders. And your, 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 uh, uh, your uh, safe performance index is designed to provide intensity levels as to the seriousness of these, of these various uh, incidents. Is that correct? Yeah, there's... I'm uh, oversimplifying, I'm sorry. Two, the two highest uh, weighting factors are on the severity measure, which includes the statutory charges for fatalities and, and disabilities, but also the highest weight also goes to the orders. And you think that would help us as opposed to the current patterns of violation exactly how? Well, on there, we're, we're, we're getting to the root of the problem that everyone has alluded to, and that is it's a very serious thing to take away the opportunities for fatalities as well. So focusing on a mine that has high injury rates and or high days that are lost is, is imperative to take care of that part of the safety culture. And then the other part of it, of course, is the orders, which are the most severe, if you will, of the conditions that are being found and cited and then SNS would follow after that. And so that you think that would give a more accurate picture of what's going on in the mines? Yes, sir, I overall? So. I think we need both of those. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Waltzman, uh, you said that, uh, uh, that you're concerned about this or you oppose the, the provisions in this mine that where operators pay miners their full wages if an operator closes an unsafe mine uh, area in anticipation of forthcoming MSHA closure order? Our, our concern there, Mr. Chairman, is that it will detract from operators taking preemptive action to address safety conditions in the mine. Do you have That's a list of operators that would not close an unsafe area not, because they had to pay the workers in that area? No, I think operators would close an unsafe area of the mine. In fact, they do that today. So then which is it? This, this is a problem or it isn't? It, 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 it is a problem, Mr. Chairman. With, with, for what I mean, operator? You, you have to look at the totality of the legislation. I don't think the, the current well, let's statute... Let's look at this provision for a second. Is well, it a I'm, problem I'm, or isn't it a problem? I, I'm going to speak to this provision, if I could. Uh, the, the current law sets limits on the, pay, the, the period of time under which a minor must be paid uh, when there is a safety violation, when there is an order issued. It's defined in the statute. 
what the legislation bef that you have introduced and is before the committee creates an open-ended situation where the operator doesn't always control the outcome of that situation. The operator has to work with the Federal Mine Safety and Health Administration to have that order lifted, and there are no controls we have over the actions of the Mine Safety and Health Administration. So during the pendency of our discussions with the agency, we have to continue to pay the mine miners in perpetuity, and that's a problem for us. And the operator has the ability in a large mine to continue to mine coal because that area may be closed but not prevent the operation in the mine. But the worker who's, who's, who's been exposed to an unsafe work area, he just subsidizes that with his loss of wages. Well, that's not always the case, Mr. Chairman. It depends how the order is written. The order may apply to a particular area of the mine or it no, may I understand apply that, to its I'm entirety. Making that, I'm making that point that the operator may not necessarily the, the, the damage to the, to the miner may be more severe than the damage to the operator here, but the miner may not have created the, uh, the unsafe working condition. Well, I agree with you, but what we want to do is prevent the damage from either one and address and I, these situations before they arise. I still like a list of operators arise. where that's a problem, where they might not close an unsafe area because they might have to pay workers. I'd like to see the names of individuals. Mr. Klein. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again to our witnesses. Uh, Mr. Stewart, uh, I, I thank you. Uh, you gave very compelling testimony in West Virginia, and you're here again today. Uh, you certainly outlined an uh, unacceptable and untenable situation, and that brings me to Mr. Roberts' uh, quote uh, when he was talking about the 41 fatalities. I believe you said, sir, that we've got to find out why, a and I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, we have at least three investigations going on, and we do, we do have to find out uh, why. Uh, Professor Grayson, um, I want to thank you for your research and the development of the Safe Performance Index. I think that's very, very helpful to us, and I hope anything that goes forward as we continue to work with this legislation will we'll, we'll include that. It really is very, very impressive work. Um, Mr. Watsman, I want to sort of turn to you and Mr. Snare here for just a minute about Section 403. I know I've got to kind of dig around in here. 403, the Underground Coal Miner Employment Standard, um, says, um, in general, an operator of an, of an underground coal mine may not discharge or constructively discharge a miner who is paid on an hourly basis and employed at an underground coal mine without reasonable job-related grounds based on a failure to satisfactorily and so forth. That, that section of the bill. Um, this does appear to create a, a brand new employment standard, uh, not for all mine workers, but just for underground coal operations. And uh, that sort of raises the obvious question of why this provision singles out underground coal miners for protection while excluding all other workers in the mine industry. But it, it really bothers me a little bit that this, this provision nullifies the at-will employment doctrine that is an important component of all of our federal labor laws. Do you have any comments about this provisions and, and what this may mean for mine operators? No. Mr. Klein, we share your concern as to the impact this has on the at-will employment doctrine. Uh, quite honestly, we don't know why this is here. Uh, we don't see the necessity for creating a special category of protection for underground coal miners as opposed to the rest of the workforce. Uh, this is one that we hope over time to be able to have further discussion uh, with the authors of the bill to understand the necessity, the need for this, and hopefully work with them to try to come to a resolution uh, once we better understand the need. Okay, thank you. I, I had a, a follow-on question from Mr. Snare, but instead I'm going to uh, pick up on the uh, political article I ran this morning, that danger on the hill, and I, the one that Dr. Price referred to, and the article says, quote, workplace safety experts say that if Congress were a private sector business, it would be at risk for massive fine from government regulators. But my question is, uh, that under uh, 5663, the language that we're looking at here, uh, does it appear to you that OSHA would have the ability to shut down the entire congressional complex in order to achieve abatement? 
if it were to apply to Congress? Well, Congressman Klein, I think, I think your question really illustrates the problems and concerns generally that we've raised with this particular bill. I mean, um, what is the way that's going to force Congress to address these particular issues? There were 6,300 hazards. I saw the same article, a quarter of which were involving life-threatening or potential fatalities. What is the best way at the end of the day to resolve those hazards and make the job, job site safer? Is it to work in a cooperative spirit in some kind of way to set up a mechanism by which to resolve it cooperatively or to come in um, with litigation, issue an immediate abatement order and essentially then put the onus to somehow try to shut down Congress? You heard the questions from Congressman Price to the Solicitor Smith as to who they're going to go after in terms of an officer or a director. There's all sorts of problems with this. And uh, again, it's a recipe for, for confusion in my judgment. All right, thank you. I, I'm sure that there are probably millions of Americans who would applaud to shutting down the entire complex, but it does, <laughs> and maybe some of us on some given days, but it, it does raise sort of an interesting question. That if you look at this in the context of other businesses, you can shut down an entire complex over this. All right, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. I know we're running out of time, and we have uh, some members who'd still like to ask questions, so I'll yield back the balance of my time. Oh, I'm sorry, did you have a, a comment? I was just hoping if I could just make a comment in, in response Absolutely. In, in response to both of, of your points. The first, in regard to the just cause uh, provision that the legislation puts in place for um, underground coal miners and the fact that that changes the at-will employment uh, situation, that's right. And Congress does that all the time when Congress decides that there's an important public policy reason behind that, uh, when it decides that workers need to be protected um, in a different way than the just cause um, I'm sorry, than the at-will standard. So mm -hmm. that's, that's not unusual what, if Congress makes the determination. That, that doesn't necessarily mean it's right for this. And that that was my question. To I would Mr. say it's Snare. right, but it's certainly not unprecedented. Congress does that all the time. And in terms of um, shutting down, OSHA shutting down Congress, the point in the legislation is to require employers to fix hazards, right. not to have OSHA shut down businesses. The, the point is on fixing the hazards. So if the legislation applied Well, to thank Congress, you. If I can just interrupt for a minute. There is a provision, though, for shutting them down. And, and, and so I realize that it's somewhat of an absurd, absurd example that was brought forth in Politico, but, but it does underscore the point that you can shut down a complex, and, and shutting down Congress is a, kind of another issue. I yield back. Jimmy is back. Uh, Ms. Wilson. So uh, some of you will be pleased to know that the uh, enlarged PAWA bill actually covers all public employees, so that would be the step before uh, including uh, congressional offices. Well, congressional offices are covered by national uh, labor relations and uh, all other wage and hour laws now. I mean, so we can go to the next step, and we will one of these days. Uh, uh, Mr. Snare, tell me who is the coalition? I'll answer. What's it made of? Who are these people that? Uh, by name, who who actually believe believe that during bad economic times that our workers are expendable, that we don't need to protect them from uh, hazards and and uh, death and poor working conditions. I mean, uh, I mean that's what, and and also part of it is uh, uh, that that these workers, the coalition, do they believe that a 19 hundreds uh, type of operation of mines is the way to take care of workers? I mean, who are these people? Can you give us a list of them? I'm, I'm happy to, uh, Congressman Woman Wolseley, and also raise a, an issue with, with the premise of your question. The Coalition for Workplace Safety, you can go to our website, is not mysterious. There's a wide variety of trade associations representing small businesses, large businesses. Examples would include the Chamber of Commerce, the Associated Builders and Contractors, the Retail Industry Leaders Association. I could name you, there are probably 30 or 40, and I'd be happy to supplement the list, representing almost every business in America, both large and small. It's not just large corporations. It'd probably be single proprietorships. And again, to the premise of so, your question as to how they regard workers, the Coalition for Workplace Safety. Well, so let me, I, okay, fine. There to, do they know that you come here in front of us and say during uh, tough economic challenges that uh, you don't have to take care of your workers? That's not what I said, Congressman, well, either in my oral that statement that or in my written. Right, if we do it right, then people are, you know, workers are going to lose their jobs. We're merely lives, raising I the issue of the better. cost 
or impact Congress. Okay. Mr. Roberts, I have a question for you. For all of my understanding of things, why isn't every single minor a member of your union? I'd be glad to support that legislation. <laughs> 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 well, I mean, what, are the, what are the operators doing that keep them from having is I mean is something happening that keeps them from being able yeah, to the, organize I would just by way of example use the upper big branch mine if I might uh, those miners uh, had three attempts to join the union there uh, the first vote that was held there was a tie vote and uh, unions lose on all ties. But not only is the CEO uh, of this company a violator of every health and safety law imaginable, uh, and every environmental law, by the way. He's had some of the worst environmental accidents or, or uh, situations in the history of mining. He's also a very uh, willful violator of, of the labor laws in this country mm -hmm. at the first vote at Upper Big Branch that ended up in a tie, he made it clear to those workers, your choice here is not whether you're a union or not. Your choice here is if you vote for the union, I'm shutting this mine down. So they gave the workers a choice of having a job or not having a job. And we see that frequently, but very much so at this particular company that's had such a terrible uh, health and safety record. So Mr. Stewart, Goose, hello. Oh, I was just going to... I would like you to speak to this question of mine. Okay. I was there during those organizing drives, and Mr. Roberts correct. Uh, CEO, Mr. Blankenship, he practically lived at that mine, had closed-door meetings with the employers. The union does not have that right. And he would have diagrams, and he would explain, here you get all these things from Massey. Over here, you get nothing from the union. He'd make it look like they were going to starve if they voted a union in. Plus, they would give out extraordinary bonuses. They would take these men on trips to Dollywood, uh, Bush Gardens, other places. I never participated. No. I want to make that clear. <laughs> but, um, and he would threatened to shut the mine down, which, you know, and I would try to tell those guys, he can't shut this mine down. That's not up to him. But they believe these things. And he would hammer it in them day after day, and he would get enough of them convinced because they would look up to him like a father figure is what I thought. And they would say, oh, he's right. He wouldn't lie to me, you know. Mm -hmm. And so he would sway enough votes to stop them from voting in the UMWA. So that's... That's part of how an organizing drive works in the world of Massey. So, uh, follow, oh, I've used all my time. May I ask one more question? Finish your question. Mm -hmm. All right, just quickly. So following the accident, do the workers still believe Mr. Blankenship is the good father? No, ma'am, I personally don't think so at least a lot of them that did before don't but I know for a fact since the accident they still blatantly flaunt the laws um, I know of one boy personally he's already quit a massive mine and went to a UMWA mine there happens to be jobs available now that hasn't always been the case you either worked for him if you had a job or you didn't work and so they abused that fear part but yes this boy was getting low air readings on the section in which he was working. So, you know, same thing we got at UBB all the time. And he was told to put it in the fireball's books as correct. Mm. And he refused to do it. So uh, he quit. He was able to secure another job. But, I mean, things like that. That's just another example of how they just blatantly flaunt the law. Thank you so much for well, your honesty to with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be real brief, and I'm going to yield real quick. Um, I think Ms. Reinhardt said that I think $969 is the top five for fine for a uh, fatality, and I agree. I think we need to look at that, but I also don't think that was implied that businesses calculate $969 versus 
the life of somebody working with me and put them in unsafe positions based on a low fine. I don't think businesses go out every day and try to put people into bad positions. The other one is, Mr. Roberts, you said that if you want to stop the lawbreakers, which is true, I mean, you just listed a whole set of laws that Massey, you said, is violated, which I, I'm taking your word for it, and there are also 31 or 41 fatalities. So the questions we're really asking, we're trying to sort out here is, is we have this incident, it happened, it's a tragedy, where laws are on the books, not enforced, and if not, let's enforce those, And because not only did this law look at that mine, it also expands other things with OSHA. But I'm gonna yield to my friend from West Virginia, because we're almost out of time. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask Mr. Grayson, in your testimony, you talked about um, we need to facilitate the creation of a safety culture of prevention of hazardous conditions. Uh, safety culture being across the board, not just the operator, but the miners themselves. The uh, uh, enforcement, um, um, uh, MSHA and others uh, that enforce the laws. Uh, from what you've heard today, we've had a lot of emphasis on you know patterns and violations and, and addressing how to create this culture of um, uh, safety. In your opinion, does this uh, does this bill adequately address the other issues? For instance, individual minor training of MSHA inspectors and and all the things that it, that. You know, there have been some questions about in, in this that you probably use as your risk assessment as well. I, honestly, I can't address that one, uh, especially about the training of MSHA inspectors. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's an internal problem, obviously, that they've got to solve, and I think they probably will solve it. But that, that's kind of a, a, a distinct issue. Mm -hmm. And the culture I was looking at is, is building a culture of safety, but it's a, a preventive, a preventive mm -hmm. type culture. And, and I do see this process of remediation, once you've been identified as a high-risk mine, is building that kind of a culture over a period of four quarters mm -hmm. with those evaluation points. Uh, thank you. Mr. Roberts, um, Mr. Rahal asked an interesting question in the last panel about uh, the inspection site of an explosion, turning it into like a police scene and um, excluding any anybody except the, the inspectors who were on the team to actually do the investigations. Now you actually went into the upper big, big branch mine and there's been, I'd like to know A, what you learned and your impression of what he, he posited out there. But the other thing I would like, it's been kind of topic of conversation in West Virginia, who should be participating in these inspections, who should be allowed in. Uh, what is your opinion on that? Well, <coughs> I think you have two possibilities to look at there, uh, Congresswoman Capito. One is what the current law says and whether or not we would want to go to something similar to what Congressman Rahal suggested. The current law allows for the miners uh, themselves to determine a representative and it doesn't, right. it's over and above whether it's a union mine or non-union mine. The miners at Upper Big Branch after this explosion designated the UMWA to be their representative. Right. The law allows us as their representative to be a full participant in this investigation, or at least we think the law says that, which clearly allows us to go underground with the federal and the state inspectors and do everything and anything that they're doing. Uh, I was listed, by the way, as one of the things that Mr. Blankenship failed to mention in his attack on allowing me to go underground. I would mention I've got 39 years uh, experience in this business been in as, probably as many coal mines as just about anybody has. So to suggest, well, uh, Cecil Roberts shouldn't go in this mine. Uh, I was listed as one of the representatives when that was given to MSHA. So I could be up there every day if I wanted to and going in this mine every day with the federal and state inspectors. And by the way, it was his idea. It was his idea to allow, uh, as he called, I forget what, how he termed it, for others to go in this mine he wanted to go. Uh, and then at the last minute, his public relations people decided it was better to say, well, we shouldn't allow anybody in the mine. He didn't go. Even his own people thought he was coming the day I was there. So the law currently says that a representative miners clearly can be a full participant in the investigation, which I took advantage of that. Whether or not we could ever get to the point where we could make this just MSHA taking the mine over, I think they actually have. I believe the authority to do that if they elected to do it, but the problem they've got is obvious, that they would have to bring people in there to run the ventilation. They'd have to bring, bring people in there to make sure the electricity was on. I'm talking about the government would. That inhibits uh, going to a full right. police state. 
And that's the problems with that approach. Well, I think the bottom line for, for you and for me and, and everybody in this room is we want the answers and we want the oh, accurate absolutely. answers to, to ad address this problem. So thank you very much. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you again for holding these hearings. Um, uh, Professor Grayson and Council Reinhardt, uh, you've presented very effective use of statistics. And Mr. Roberts, uh, you bring the history of mining and mine regulation alive. Uh, thank you for excellent testimony. And your powerful story about the young, yet not yet certified miner uh, is, is a story everyone in this country should hear. As someone who grew up in West Virginia and was raised with, from my earliest memory, admiration for the courage and the work ethic of miners, I've got to tell you, Mr. Stewart, Goose, um, you are an embodiment of courage. Thank you for what you do, but especially thank you for what you've done today. Not easy, I'm sure. Um, with that, let me yield any remaining time uh, to my colleague from West Virginia, Mr. Ray Hall. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Uh, let me just uh, follow up uh, and commend uh, Mr. Stewart as well for your courage and taking the time being with us today. Uh, in your testimony, you said it so well. You said this bill must pass to keep coal companies honest or to make them pay the price for their unscrupulous behavior. Here's the most important line. Partisanship needs to be set aside on this legislation because human lives are at stake. You said that, Goose. Thank you for saying that. Because uh, it's often a fear in this contentious election year that these efforts may morph into a political exercise, those harshly against it, knowing that they have the party of no and the other body uh, to stop whatever may pass this body. And I, I hope that's not the case. We owe more to the miners who perished at UBB uh, than to use this issue as any political talking point. So I hope Mr. Watsman, Mr. Roberts, UMWA and NMA will remain engaged with this committee, uh, re remain engaged with the staff of this committee who worked so long and hard on this bill, who have been on the scene, who were on the scene the morning after UBB happened. Uh, who have the knowledge, the expertise, have been around in the agencies and been around this hill for uh, decades, let's put it that way. Uh, I hope you'll remain engaged with them, resist the inertia that too often comes in election years to retreat into partisan corners or each member offer their own proposal, pitting one member's proposal against another. I hope we don't get into that. And I hope you'll agree that, that you'll help us do that uh, work together. I'm not saying every point in this bill, every part of this bill is perfect. I'm not saying that at all. But I do think it is the vehicle that we need to be engaged with. And I would hope uh, both, uh, all parties would allow us that opportunity. Uh, let, me, let, let me ask a specific question and, and I'll allow both of you to, since I mentioned your names, to comment on my initial point. But anyway, I appreciate the concern, especially you, Mr. Watchman, have about the good actor that operates and not being penalized by the provisions of this particular bill. But my question is, what about the good actors who are penalized when bad actors break the law, cut corners, and are allowed to get away with it? I heard it this past weekend. I was at a mine site in my district this past weekend uh, where safety violations are few and far between, and they're inspected by the same inspectors as the other guy that, uh, where the disaster occurred. It was just down the road from UBB. So uh, how, should we just be turning a blind eye to those bad actors who allow miners to die for the sake of their own competitive, their own competitive advantage in the market? Thank you, Congressman. And I think the short answer is absolutely not. We should not be turning a blind eye to that. Uh, the law should be enforced, and it should be enforced to its fullest extent. We shouldn't condone the actions of anybody who's intentionally violating the law. It's a very strong law. The agency has the tools, and we encourage them to use those tools. 
mine safety should not comp create a competitive advantage for one operator as opposed to another. Uh, that is something that we have never talked uh, and, and argued for, nor will we ever. Uh, mine safety should come first and foremost. And to your earlier point, let me assure you that we will be engaged. Uh, we've met with your staff. We've met with the committee staff. I think we've had good, open, honest discussions about the legislation. Uh, my statement identifies areas where we think there is areas of agreement uh, with some wordsmithing around the edges. I mean, the pattern of violation system as it currently exists does not work for anybody. It doesn't work for the miners, it doesn't work for the mine operators, it doesn't work for the agency. It's not transparent, no one understands it, no one knows how you work your way through it, how you get off of it. So there are areas where we think that there can be agreement and we pledge to work with you and the m other members of this committee to, to reach that agreement. Thank you. Please, sir. Well, you have uh, our commitment, Congressman, uh, to, to work uh, to find uh, uh, acceptable uh, resolution to any problems that might exist here. Uh, but to answer your question about these operators who are cutting corners and putting their miners at risk, selling their coal cheaper into the marketplace, one of two things will happen here. Either uh, the, the operators who are investing heavily in health and safety and protecting their workers and spending money on mine rescue and safety programs are going to have to quit spending that money to compete with these people over here or we're going to raise these people up. That's the choice that Congress faces here today, in my opinion. We're either going to have to bring these people up to this standard here or that everybody's going to fall right here because you can't ask people to try to stay in business. They won't be able to. And as long as more and more people are allowed to compete on this basis. Mr. Senator, let me ask you one quick last question. Should any worker in the United States of America today have to put their life in jeopardy to earn a livelihood? Uh, no, you're no. Congressman. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Watsman, I talked during the first panel, you may have heard about the regional enforcement with regard to MSHA, and I was wondering in your experience, do you see a difference in the strength of enforcement among different regions? I don't think it's so much a question of the strength of enforcement. It's a difference in terms of application of the standards and how a particular inspector within a region or a field office supervisor or a district manager interprets the regulatory requirements as opposed to those same d individuals in a different region. I mean, you see variability across the, across the MSHA districts, where one will have a very high SNS rate for the operations in their, in their, under their purview, and another one will have a, an SNS rate that is significantly lower. So I, I think it's more an interpretive question. Many of these regulations are subjective. I mean, we don't work in a black and white environment. Many of it is, uh, much of it is gradients of gray, and it's the interpretation of the individual as to whether or not a, a violative condition exists. Thank you. Professor Grayson, uh, in your work with the commission that you chaired, what were, what were your findings on that? We had 72 recommendations altogether, but the heart of the, the entire document was that we need to build a culture of prevention and do everything right from top to bottom. Everybody in critical task must perform them well, just like Mr. Stewart's saying. It, I mean, it's got to be done. Once you do that, your SNS citations, your order rates, your injuries all go down. But and did, productivity can't be maintained. Did you find you talked earlier about the top performing mines? That was not part of that commission. Uh, all we did is look at the. Well, I understand that, yeah, but yeah. but in your experience, is there a a regional cluster of top performing mines? Is there a disparity that exists? I anywhere? did not try to regionalize that, but uh, from the analysis I did do, it, it, it looked like, with, without doing the statistics on it, it looked like the western mines tended to be performing better in general, mm -hmm. knowing the top level. And was the reverse true anywhere in the country where there was a region that had more work to do than others? Mm, as I recall, it probably was southern West Virginia, eastern Kentucky. And I would ask uh, yeah. Professor Grayson and then Mr. Watsman and any, any other panel members who may want to comment, uh, do you believe that there is a relationship between profits and safety so that if you are 
more or less safe as a mine, that that is going to inversely affect your profits? Uh, I've done a, a research study in the past and uh, did not use profits, but rather productivity, right. so tons per employee hour. And what we found in that study, and it was a, you know, it was a pretty good sized study, there, were, uh, there was a, a direct uh, negative correlation for higher productivity and, uh, and lower severity measure in large mines and very large mines. It wouldn't wash out statistically in medium sized mines, 50 to 100. And then in the small mines, the, as the productivity went up, the severity measure also went up. So the, the more production, the less safe. Right. Mr. Watsman? Well, I think the age old saying goes that a safe mine is a productive mine, and that's shown time and time again. Uh, safety violations unfortunately have the, the, the potential to lead to accidents, which leads to shutdowns of the operation, whether it's the operation in its entirety or a particular portion of the mine. So I think that there is a general understanding uh, that a, uh, a productive mine is a safe mine. Mr. Roberts, do you want to comment? I, I would tend to agree. In fact, not only tend to agree, I absolutely agree that you can look at some of the most profitable companies in this country, like Consol, for example, uh, in your, your area. Uh, they have some of the most profitable coal mines in the United States of America. They invest heavily in health and safety. They have invested heavily in mine rescue teams. They've invested heavily in making their mines safe, and they're one of the most profitable companies in the country. Right. Anyone else on the panel? I would Reinhardt. just add that from the in terms of the workplaces that are covered by the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the same is true, that the good companies that invest in safety um, have lower injury, illness, and fatality records and lower costs related to those, those injuries and fatalities relative to other, uh, other workplaces, and so it's a good investment. Congressman, I can also just again just to echo uh, Ms. Reinhardt's comments, and during my tenure at the Labor Department, I, it, was, it was our understanding in the sites that I would visit, employers that I would visit, those who made the necessary investments in safety and health were also more productive. The key is, how do you get to that point and what are the best methodologies? Is it providing the necessary assistance so an employer understands their obligation or the other? That's part of the debate we're having today. But again, I think the bottom line premise to your question is, you know, a productive, uh, a safe workplace is going to be a productive workplace generally. Professor Grace. Yeah, one last, one last comment, and it's relating to the study I, I described to you. The, uh, the small mines, so 50 or fewer employees, tend not to have a resident safety person. They have someone who travels around, whereas large mines have maybe multiple safety people. They tend to have inferior equipment rather than new equipment, and they can't afford that as well either. They tend to work in tougher conditions, and there's a general cultural difference too in, in those small mines from the large mines. Thank not you. all of them, but. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Klein. No question, I just want to thank the witness. Thank you. I want to thank you very much for coming here, but I'd like to make a couple of, uh, oh, excuse me, Mr. Holt. Um, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Roberts, uh, considering the importance, I mean, it's statistically clear that organized union minds uh, are different uh, in, in the numbers. Uh, I'm wondering whether you think the whistleblower provisions of this legislation are good enough considering that uh, some mines, uh, many miners, are working in non-unionized conditions? Well, I'm reminded of what Eleanor Roosevelt said in the 30s after visiting a coal mine and she was in Wheeling, West Virginia and went across the river to Ohio and went in a coal mine in the 30s. She came out and she said, there's only two ways to, pr to protect miners in this country. That's legislation and unionization. It's one of the two or both in combination. I think that the whistleblower protections in this is a bold step forward by this Congress if they pass this legislation. And I think it goes a long ways, but there's still, uh, a, it, a, there's a culture that exists also uh, in certain parts, particularly southern West Virginia and eastern Kentucky that no one can protect you from Don Blankenship, the CEO of Massey. Now that's their fear. You may keep your job at a protector mine, but a mine have, mines have infinite lives. Uh, some two years, some 10 years, some 20 years. But once that mine works out, even if you keep your job there, well, you're gonna be hired by Massey at the next mine. The fear is you won't be, and that's the end of your career. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, 
just on, on, on that point, so, so I think people say, well, why is this, this in, in, in this law? I mean, I appreciate the doctrine at will. I don't know where the doctrine came from, but the fact of the matter is, if the doctrine at will puts you in danger, you may want to think about changing that, that doctrine. And uh, uh, Mr. Stewart, in your testimony, you said, uh, I worked a long wall in dust so thick I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. I couldn't breathe because of the improper ventilation. I once went to the assistant coordinator and asked him why we didn't have proper air on the long wall face. I was told, it's funny, you're the only one to say anything about it. My response was, that's because they are too afraid to lose their jobs to say anything. Later in your testimony, you tell us that big outfits like Massey will always find ways to fire you regardless of the laws. That is why it's important to have the rights to challenge an unfair firing in an underground coal mine. With a union, you have that right. Without a union, the bills give the miners protection to fight firings that are not based on good cause. So if the employers have it their way, you, wouldn't, you couldn't be fired in their mind for, for, uh, for raising safety issues. You but, the but you could be fired for no reason. It's just a question of, of, of the time lag here. Nobody fires you on the spot. Right. They just catch up with you later. Mm -hmm. Another day, another week, another circumstance, a different part of the mine, you're gone. Right. And everybody knows why you're gone. Exactly. And uh, they had a, they, you know, they, they used what they call writing a man up for little or nothing or things they normally wouldn't write. They write you up a couple of times, they got their paperwork, and then the next time they say he's gone. And if he tries to fight it, they say, look, this man's being written up. He's not been performing properly, poor work performance, and he's gone. You know, regardless, uh, I mean, I've seen him fire a guy. They went to the section, Chris Blanchard, in fact, and asked him questions. One question was how many buggies he had loaded. He was a minor operator and a good one. The boy said he didn't know how many. I ran a minor. I never knew how many buggies I loaded. I don't try to count them. You're concentrating on your job. The buggy men count. Anyway, he fired him, said lack of interest in his job. It's quite, quite possible, but let me just say this, and I don't want members to get too far away from what took place in Beckley. And when you testified, you stunned not only the members of this committee and people who are pretty darn familiar with coal mining as to the discussions about retaliation and intimidation and about warning and, and uh, that, the, that the inspectors were coming on to the, to the property. But I just want to, for the record, again, recall for the members of the committee your testimony was collaborated by Eddie, Eddie Cook, who was the uncle of Adam Morgan, by Gary Quarles, who was the father of Gary Wayne Quarles, of Alice Peters, who was a mother-in-law of Edward Dean Jones, of Steve Morgan, who was the father of Adam Morgan, and Clay Mullins, who was a brother of Rex Mullins, all who died in this accident, all who testified about the problems of intimidation and the fear in their relatives that died here about raising these, these safety issues in an, with an outfit like Massey. And so we ought not to forget that. The idea that somehow it's sacrosanct that Massey can fire anybody for no reason at all, that somehow that protects these miners, their families, is just blown away by this, by this, uh, uh, by this testimony. And I think it's important that we, uh, that we uh, understand that. And uh, 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 Mr. Grayson, I want to thank you for your, uh, for your index. We've, we've looked at it very carefully and we hope to some extent this, this legislation mirrors what you're, what you're trying to do and trying to point out. Because with all due respect to the culture, I've been involved with British Petroleum for many, many years. When I was chair of the, of, of, of the Resources Committee, my service on the Resources Committee, Mr. Ray Hall knows about this. I've had more executives come into my office over the many years telling me how they're going to change the culture and then something blows up. Somebody gets killed. A spill, a spill happens all over the United States of America. They can't change the culture because they really don't have any benchmarks. They don't know what's going on in that place and plus they have a problem. All they want to do is cut costs. Three independent commissions. And so this idea that good actors, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't very, very long, not long at all, before the CEO of a major oil company who's out there in deep water said, we don't operate that way. I said, well, you, you better differentiate yourself because you're about to pay the price. And sure as hell, that's what's going on. And so what this country saw unfold 
They now want to know what's, what's, what's the safety factor, what's the culture, if you will. Now, those operators are all telling us how, these, how, how BP operates, and it's not consistent. It's not consistent on cost. It's not consistent on reporting. It's not consistent on worker protection. They brought me their posters and said, Here's, anybody can pull the switch at any time and shut this place down. Well, apparently they couldn't right before the BP accident because they were afraid of losing their job, and jobs are hard to come by. And so it's easy to talk about, well, we're just going to improve the culture. These laws on the books, they didn't improve the culture of Mr. Massey's operation, Mr. Blankenship's operation at Massey. But yet we know when you change the laws, you can change behavior. Look at driving, driving under the influence. Look at seat belts. Education combined with rational penalties, penalties that people were fearful of, behavior changes. So I think we got a good beginning with this draft of this, of this, uh, of this legislation. Uh, and, and I want to thank you for your, uh, 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 for your, uh, your testimony. And, uh, uh, but these are critical issues, and these are critical issues that reflect a very complex and an inherently dangerous place. There is a reason why, we're, why, we, why we address coal mines in this, uh, uh, in this area. Uh, but we look forward to continuing to work with you as we, uh, as we craft this legislation. We would like to move it soon, uh, but we're certainly open. I've read all of your testimony over the... Uh, uh, before coming to this hearing, and I've raised, I got a lot of underlines and a lot of questions, so we'll uh, we'll pour through that. Uh, anything from you? With that, the uh, the committee will stand adjourned. Without objection, member. Excuse me. Before I adjourn, without objection, the, the members will have 14 days to submit additional material questions for the uh, uh, for the hearing record, which I think I have another one on intimidation. Thank you. Committee stands adjourned. <laughs>